to this. Okay, test, test. Can you hear me now? Am I coming through? Okay. All right. Uh, interesting. Interesting. I didn't know this about OBS's audio settings. I guess I should do like this for future. Nah, sure, whatever. Um, greetings. Welcome. Okay. I had started to talk to you guys <laughs> when I thought, I mean, my mic settings, it looks like my mic is picking up audio and all that. And indeed it is. It just, it wasn't on the right audio track. So, um, I said hello to you guys already, but nobody heard that. So welcome. Welcome to our modder, uh, live stream event tonight, which sounds way more official and fancy, um, than it really is. Uh, it's basically just going to be us messing around with battle mercs and me trying to show you the inner workings of this beast um, as best I can. So um, just give me a thumbs up if you heard that. I'm just paranoid that my audio is not going to come through and then you won't hear it. But thumbs up in the chat if you heard everything I said up till now. And then I'll just assume you hear me moving forward. Um, and if I go silent for a long period and you don't hear me, then... Uh, uh, I haven't passed out face down. I'm probably still talking. <laughs> just something happened to my mic. So just, just mention it. Okay, we're seeing thumbs up. Perfect. Guys, how are you all doing here tonight? I hope the answer is good. Um, so recently I released Battle Mercs. Everybody's been playing it. Everybody's been enjoying it. It's so awesome. Um, it really is awesome to see so many people enjoying it. Um, but, you know, one of the main limiting factors that I always knew about Battle Mercs is content. You know, how are you going to create all this content uh, in the game? And the truth is, from the bottom to the top, I tried to design this game to be moddable. Um, and so, um, I want to show you guys how to mod the game today. Um, so let's just transition over here. And in fact, I'm even though I love the Mech Commander music, we are just going to sort of pause it here for now. Um, so it's not just persistent in the background as we work here. Um, so, in fact, actually, I have some slides. Let me see how I can do this. Uh, let's see. View. Um, not there it is. And I want this on this. And let's see if we can do this up. Okay, so there's that. And there we go. All right, topics for today. So this is my, I, I kind of brainstormed. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh, breaking out the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, no, don't worry. I, I literally have three slides. So it's like this and two others. And we're not even going to look at the others immediately. Um, I was just trying to brainstorm ahead of tonight, you know, what, all the things I could show you would be. Uh, and so here's kind of a rough outline of what I think will work. But again, as we're going through stuff, um, yeah, and this is kind of, this is a long-winded timeshare pitch. That's right, free DAO. So if you guys could invest early and often, it's really going to set your families up for success down the line. It's only $10,000 a year. That is the, the end game of Battlemarks. No, 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 no. Um, so this is our outline of uh, rough topics. And as we're going through this, if things come up and you, know, you think of something you want to ask, feel free to throw it in the chat and... Um, I'll, I'll answer as many questions as I can. If your question would require like a really long response and take us really far off topic, I may say, try and hang around to the end, or I may say, you know what, join the Discord and I can try and help you there. Um, if you are in the Discord already, um, we're building up a good knowledge base there. Um, luckily, people in the Discord have been taking it upon themselves to take information I've been giving them and like start to add it to like FAQs and manuals and stuff. So if you know how to do stuff in the game, um, contributing to that in the Discord, contributing to the documentation would be great because I just don't have the time to do it all myself. But it's one little thing you could contribute if you think, oh, you know, I'm not really good with editing maps. Well, if you know a little bit about how they're supposed to be edited, you could contribute just by helping that way. Um, so yeah, so we'll take a look at uh, tiled and tile sets very briefly. I already have some videos on the Discord on how to make maps. So today won't be a map making day, but we'll just... Um, take a look at those real quick. 
Uh, we'll talk a lot more today about triggers, so map triggers, and then how you can use those to make RPG sections. And we have already campaigns and sections in the game that use triggers, so I'll kind of step through some of those. Um, and I can show you guys kind of how that works. Um, we'll touch on graphics, um, you know, and like how to create custom graphics and stuff. Um, I'll try and show you the file structure and the, fo the JSON files behind things like units, factions, and maps. Um, and then in theory, you can pull this all together and make your own campaign, but how do you actually make it so the game detects a new campaign? So we'll talk about that really briefly. Um, and then um, I think this was just sort of miscellaneous stuff, um, just sort of tips and good habits and stuff. So there's the first slide. We're done. And nobody's been sucked into an MLM yet, so we're good. Um, so let me, let's see, uh, switch to back to this. Okay. There we go. I'm using OBS studios and I'm using like, uh, I forget what it's called. It's like the, the preview feature before, and I've never used this before, but I really should. It's actually like really convenient. Oh my God. And I can pin the chat into OBS. Okay, you guys can't see what I'm doing here, but. This is like game changing for me. I've always said I want to do more streaming, but uh, it's just never, um, haven't had the time for it. Um, and uh, it's exciting to have new tools and see like what you can actually do. It's pretty cool streaming. Anyway, that's not the topic of today. Um, okay, let me, we're not going to jump right into the game immediately. Instead, I want to show you um, file structures. So let's pull up the resources and we'll do it this way okay try to make this bigger and then I'll change the scene so you guys can see okay hold on what is happening here view I want details but how do you zoom this in Okay, here, how about this idea? I know what we can do. Um, we can change this specific window to, um, there we go. Okay, how's this? Can people kind of see what we're looking at here in terms of uh, the files? I don't know if it's big enough. Uh, no, I'll keep it on this window here. Um, okay, well, you can take my word for it if you can just sort of broadly see. I guess, actually, maybe I can just change these to large icons. It doesn't matter if it's not in a list. Um, okay, this is the resources folder of Battlemerks, and if you've just played Battlemerks, you haven't poked around in here too much. This is sort of where all the magic uh, lives. And um, just to give you an overview of what's in here, you know, each folder basically um, sort of contains a different kind of data. So, for example, in the Anims folder, we have animations and you can go in and, you know, animations are just right now a series of images in order with little information about how much time between each frame. Um, and we're not really going to dive into animations very much today. Uh, but you can see, you know, there's like a fonts folder, an images folder, which is pretty big. This contains all the images in the game. And we'll talk about image files and JSON data in a minute. But basically the way Battlemerks works is it is a big collection of all this data. And when it comes time to make your own campaigns, there is an actual uh, campaign folder. And as you can see right now, we have Legacy, Mech Warrior, and the CHR, which stands for the Crescent Haw uh, Hawks Revenge. The way these folders work is that within this folder, you can have your own um, images and maps, folders, and so on. Um, and if you look in, for instance, the image folder of the Legacy campaign, you'll notice that it has far fewer files than the uh, images folder of the default uh, resources folder. And the, re the default resources folder has all sorts of images that the campaign is actually using. And so just right off the bat, just to sort of, you know, get you thinking in terms of like how this stuff is organized, the way the game works is if you are running the Crescent Hawks campaign, and at a certain point, the game says, okay, pull up Intersphere Map 3025. You have it in your JSON script or something like that. 
then what the game will do is first look in, in the images folder for the specific campaign. And if it can't find the image, it defaults into the image folder for the entire game and looks in there. And there it will find the uh, inner sphere map that it needs to. And so the way you can think about campaigns and, and making your own mods and all of this is that you can create sort of these add-on versions of the game that if you don't include extra files, it will always revert back to the default files that exist, you know, in this base folder that get used by the career and stuff like that. But if you put anything in one of your campaign's own folders, that will get used first. So if you wanted to have a custom star map for the Crescent Hawks Inception, you could literally um, take, for instance, the 3025 map if you want. This is just the image, mind you. This wouldn't be um, uh, this wouldn't be all the data. We'll we'll talk about the data in a moment. Um, but you could sort of take this 3025 map. You could throw it into um, your campaign's image folder, and then you could go and edit this file. And you can make all the changes that you want to it. And the cool thing is that now your campaign will have its own 3025 map that will look different from the general one. Um, but you haven't overwritten the general one. And indeed, your campaign sort of lives by itself and it's not interfering with anything in the general. So in terms of just thinking about how the files are structured, and if you do go digging into these resource folders, the way to understand them is everything in the base resource folder, this is sort of the common baseline files. If you want your campaign to use custom files, then you just create, for instance, you know, maybe you want to have different texts in the arena. So you could create a texts and arena folder, and rather than having um, these default uh, text files in the game, um, you can put that um, in your, um, in, you could have your own custom, you know, text descriptions for the, your campaign. Um, somebody asked, does that apply to every file? Um, yes. I think the only files where it's not currently applying is the sounds. Um, and that's just due to the fact that, uh, um, laziness. <laughs> There's no other good answer. It was just sort of like, you know, a quick thing to add the sounds in at one point. And I just haven't gone back and fixed it. But pretty much every file, it should work that way. Um, and so this is how, you know, if you do go and look in, for instance, um, you know, the maps folder um, here, um, there will be uh, a handful of maps related to Pacifica in the legacy folder. Um, however, there's all sorts of maps that are missing in here. There's no contract maps. There's no, you know, uh, arena maps and Solaris maps. And you may say, how does this campaign know where those maps are? Well, it's easy. If it if it's trying to read a contract and the contract says, you know, go into the maps folder and get a, a under the contract subfolder, you'll find a map for me. Um, it will first look for that uh, contract subfolder in its map folder doesn't find it, it bumps back down to the general resources, goes into maps, looks for the contract folder, looks for the corresponding mission. This is, oh, here's the file. So it sort of tries your campaign first, then it defaults back to the uh, general one. Um, okay, so that was just something I wanted to kind of cover off the bat so we understood um, the structure of the file system itself. So since we are looking at maps, um, let's go ahead and open up a map here and we can look at some maps. So I'm gonna change this view here. Um, let's see. So we want scene transition. There we go, boom. All right, now we're just looking at all the maps here. Um, so we can get rid of this for now. Or actually, I guess I could just leave it over here. Um, okay, so maps, these, um, are all open in a free program called Tiled. Um, if you don't have Tiled, um, as I say, it's free. So, you know, we can just, uh, let's see here. If you go into the, if you Google Tiled, you'll get this. Um, and Tiled is actually a pretty cool map editor. I've used it for a couple of things over the years, but I know it's legit used in some real games. Um, it has its own JavaScript stuff, but the game doesn't do anything with that. So really, you know, uh, tiled here, um, if you open up an existing map, um, you'll be able to like edit it right off the bat. 
And again, I have some uh, decent tutorials uh, online uh, on the Discord showing you how to actually edit maps. Uh, but it's as simple as, you know, uh, tiled maps have a series of layers and on each layer you can draw things. And I've already set up a bunch of, uh, you know, different tile sets. So you can come in, like draw sand if you wanted. Um, and you can just sort of fill in some sand here. Um, and uh, I don't know what else you could do. But yeah, it's as simple as going in like this to make your maps. Um, and... There's, a, there's two special layers um, which will be relevant for us today, especially one is triggers and one is block. Um, could you make a battle merch focus playlist on your channel? Good idea. I will throw that together. And I think the map editing video is unlisted because I made it back when we did the alpha. I'll make that public so people can find it more easily. Um, but anyway, most of these layers deal with, you know, buildings, terrain, mountains, all that stuff. So... Um, you can go ahead and make uh, different cool maps here. By the way, you see these buildings that are sort of flashing between like okay and destroyed. These, those are actually, um, uh, those are actually destructible buildings. So in the tile sets, let's see, where are we? Target buildings, neutral buildings. Oh, here is tile sets. Um, there is a destructible tile sheet. Um, and I can show you this too. So in our resources, um, so a tiled map, the map itself, um, sort of contains the organization of the whole map. It relies on a tile set. And in this game, the tile sets have to go in a tile sets folder, um, either for your campaign or for, you know, the general game. So if you go into a specific... Uh, you know, like legacy here, there's some tile sets and you'll find uh, tile sets here. A tile set in tiled is an image file along with um, an actual tile set file. So for instance, um, we have CH buildings here and this is a tile set for new buildings. Um, if we open up, oops, I don't want to print that. If we open up new buildings, you will see that these are all the, these are all, this is the images that are, they're in this image file. And then if we open up CH buildings, you can open this directly in tiled and see here is that sprite sheet, but it's been basically cut up into tiles. And if you do want to get into editing tile sets and stuff, if you right click on any um, particular tile, you can see these tiles have properties. So for instance, a wall is block and jumpable. Uh, but it does block your vision. Vision 255 is, it's, it's you know, blocking vision by a lot. Um, if we go into CH Terrain, this is all the terrain that's in the game. If you, for instance, look at Forest, it has a 50% chance of uh, lighting on fire. That's the flammable property. Uh, this is Light Forest, so it reduces speed to 75% of your ideal speed. It is decreases your to hit chance so your chance of being hit if you're standing on this tile and it adds one to your vision uh in the sense your vision blocking calculation so the way the game works when it's calculating line of sight between two units if there's more than i think it's like three or four uh vision points between them then they can't see each other and that's you know from battle tech if you have too much forest between you you can't see the other guy so here's dense forest. It blocks vision by two, gives you a 25% less chance of getting hit, slows you down even further, can also catch on fire. Um, here's a hill. It has one elevation. That's all the properties it has. Um, here's a mountain. It has, it's blocked and it blocks your vision too. So vision 255 basically guarantees that you can't see through it because again, a vision score of about three or four and then you can't see the other guy. Um, here's water. So heat sinks are 1.5 times as effective. You get a water ripple effect on hit. There's speed and there's water ripple. Um, I think there's deep water here, which just slows you down even further. It doesn't give you a further heat advantage. And then the one other thing, since we are in the tile sheets, is if you come over to like uh, sand, there's this thing called walk stamp. And this tells it when somebody 
when a mech is like walking through this tile or when a vehicle is driving through this tile, should it put feet print or tire tracks? And if it's a mech, it will look for foot underscore sand and it will look for that image to sort of stamp on the map as like its footprints of the mech walking. If it's a vehicle, it will look for, I think it's tracks underscore sand. And so this is how you could make a new tile um, set and you could give it different footprints for, um, you know, the, the mech uh, to leave when it walks and, you know, here ridges and stuff. So yeah, you can go ahead and peek around at some of these existing tile sets and the buildings and stuff. If you want to get an idea of the kinds of modifiers you can add to tiles. But then the cool thing is when you build a map, um, it just automatically, you know, if there's a forest here, it just knows to add those calculations to the game. You don't have to do anything in the map. So you set up your tiles correctly, and then you can draw your map so it looks cool, and then you're set. Um, the one other thing I was going to mention is there's this destructibles, uh, these destructible buildings, and they have their own tile set. So buildings indestructibles. And for these tiles, you can see these are actually animated tiles. That's why you have this sort of little movie strip. And so this tile um, in, um, in tiled here was set up to be an animation between this, this, and this. And so this tile is set up to be an animation between this cell, this cell, and this cell. And so that's why they're kind of animating in the actual map. During gameplay, though, that animation is interpreted as those are destructive. Uh, destruction uh, cells so for instance here um, if you right click on this cell you can see okay this is blocked off it has a building ID it has a default name that will show up in game if people target it or select it in this case it's a power generator that explodes on damage so explosion damage explosion radius how many hit points it has um, and uh, by setting this up as an animated tile, which off the top of my head, I can't remember how I did. I think it's tile set, yeah, tile animation editor. And then you can go ahead and, um, there are lots of tiled tutorials on how to do this, so I won't reconstruct it, because I did this a while ago, I can't fully remember, but um, essentially animations are interpreted, as long as it's in a destructible building, they're interpreted as explosions. Um, so here's another one. This one doesn't explode, but it still has hit points. This is 250 hit points. Um, and there are buildings that can be targeted, like these ones, I believe. And then there are these ones that can't be targeted, but if a stray shot, so this has one hit point. If a stray laser happens to land on this tile, it will damage or destroy it. Um, so this is kind of cool. You can make buildings that just happen to be destroyed by random shots. And I was starting to work on these other ones and never got around to finishing them, so... Um, I, I'm not done, by the way, but if somebody wants to fill some of these in, that'd be actually really helpful um, if someone can figure this out. Um, there's one other thing that came to mind that I wanted to mention. Oh, um, since we are here, since we are looking at all these tiles and stuff, let's see. Um, there also is animated tiles. These are the animated tiles that get used in the RPG. And so these are like the crowds of people. Um, these are like the electric fields. Um, and again, um, in the RPG segments of the game, animations are just treated as animations, I believe. I believe that's how that works. So I'm hearing a dripping sound. Time out for one sec. I want to make sure water isn't leaking into my basement. That actually happened once on stream. Um, give me one second here.
All right, I'm back. And there was some water. I'll deal with it after. <laughs> of course, it happens when you're streaming. Uh, let me catch up on the chat here. Um, let's see. People are asking a few things. Is it easy to add custom properties to different tiles? Um, yes. Um, whew, hopefully, as easy as you just saw, you can just click on uh, the items and add them. Go over all the heat sink efficiency for terrain types. I think it's literally just the water tiles increase your efficiency. One other thing you can do is on any given map, oh, I, I should mention this, it's actually good. There's map properties. And um, for instance, you know, when you click on this map and it gets pulled up in a contract, the contract will describe it as combat um, in an urban environment. So terrain article is an or the or a, and train type is the actual train type. And then loading image is just, you know, should you show a city or a beach? Um, if you don't specify anything, it'll just have a random loading image. Um, but yeah, so this is how you would specify if uh, there's any map-wide properties. So if we actually um, were to go in to, let's see, let's find a, an ice map. So under contracts, um, deathmatch, um, and we go into Arctic. Um, you can see heat sinks 2.0. This means in this Arctic terrain, heat sinks are twice as effective. Um, similarly, if we go into uh, like a desert map, there's a heat sinks 0.75. Heat sinks are 75% effective. So you can have some map wide properties if you want. Um, I know it does, I know heat sinks is tracked as a map wide. I don't know if there's other properties that would get tracked as map wide. Uh, heat is the most obvious one. I mean, maybe something like vision if you had like a dusty planet or something, but um, I don't think I've set any of that up. So I can't say for certain if they will get tracked properly, but heat for sure will at the, the map level. Um, can you go over all the heat sinks efficiencies? Did that? Um, okay. Um, now we had been talking about, let's see. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else to really mention here. Um, the, uh, you know, in the map making tutorial, I do mention that just due to sort of a, a workaround, you do have to add a blocked layer on the very top. And I usually make it semi-transparent. It doesn't matter what tile you put here. I just have to put red tiles so they're visible, but you could draw anything. And the blocked tile is interpreted as sort of like no movement zones. And essentially this is done so that the user interface doesn't um, get in the way of, uh, so units can't move into areas that you can't see on the map. So anyway, that's a technicality, but make sure you have the blocked area if you're gonna make your own maps. But then the important thing that um, we're going to expand on today are map triggers. So map triggers um, are, you know, essential to how maps work in this game. Um, so you can see this is a defense mission and there's a trigger here that says defense target. That's how this building gets selected as the defense target on a defense map. We have a few other triggers marked turret spawn. Um, these indicate where turrets can spawn on the map. And you'll see when we look at actual mission JSON files, they look for these specific triggers and that they're passed along as where to put certain units. We have player spawn, which are where the player will spawn. And then we have enemy spawn and we have evac zones. So on defense maps, there's a handful of different triggers that are essential. Um, if these triggers aren't here, uh, a map won't work. It'll crash. Um, well, depending on which trigger is missing. But essentially, if you want to have uh, a map, you have to have the right triggers. Case in point, on some of the convoy maps, um, the convoy is headed to a place called Convoy Evac. And I created a few maps a while ago, and I labeled those sites evac zones. And some people mentioned that there was a, a convoy mission where when it starts up, the convoy doesn't go anywhere. They just sit there, and there's no way to end the mission. It's because the game trigger said send the convoy to the convoy evac, but there was no convoy evac, so the convoy didn't do anything. 
Um, and so you can get those kinds of glitches if you get into map making and you uh, have the wrong triggers in there. So triggers are just in tiled, um, an object layer. And then once you have an object layer, you come in here, you draw a square and you give it a name. So this is player spawn. Um, you can have triggers that have the same name. So you'll see a bunch of turret spawns and player spawns. Uh, when you have triggers with the same names, they usually get decided randomly by the game. Um, so for instance, you know, there's enemy spawns all around the edge of the map. When uh, the computer is told spawn an enemy unit at enemy spawn, it will see that there are nine options and it will pick one. So this allows you to sort of have randomness in your maps. Um, but they're nothing more than just simple objects. And you don't have to line them with the grid or anything. It, you know, it'll... Uh, figure out where it needs to be so you don't have to be super specific or anything but you just draw things the way you want them give them a name and then they get added into the map uh, trigger database when the map is loaded okay so um what do you do with these um so then so somebody says so the name of the trigger determines its function the answer is sort of because its true function gets determined in a json file and so Let's actually look at one of those um, together. And then let's look at uh, the JSON file for a defense map. And then it might become clearer as to like what all these different, um, uh, all these different things are for. So the maps folder for your contracts contains, you know, different kinds of contracts and then a list of maps. Um, and then if you go into the scripts folder, um, there's all sorts of different scripts. I'll, we'll talk about this more, but for now, let's focus on in the contracts folder. Um, these are all the different contracts that exist in the game. Um, and so we want to grab a defense one. You can see there's different kinds of defense missions. Um, let's see, they end around here. So you have assault missions, heavy, light, medium, one wave, two wave, three wave. Um, so let's just grab, let's grab an assault three wave. And we'll take a look at what's going on in this file. And, oh good, I can't zoom in here for you guys. So this game uses JSON files a lot. Almost every data file is either a JSON file or a text file or a PNG, but there's way more JSON files than anything else. Um, you can use any text editor for editing JSON files. I, you know, when I actually do my coding and stuff, I use... Um, you know, Visual Studio Code here. So this is what I use a lot. Um, I quite like it. I love the fact that it color codes things. And in fact, we may look at some JSON files in this, but um, this is another program called Genie. This one's okay, but truthfully, I'd recommend some others. Um, the one thing about Genie is if you're like missing a comma or something, and so your JSON file is technically invalid, it won't warn you, but Visual Studio does. So that's a, a good thing. Um, people might have some other recommendations, uh, and if so, you could drop them in the comments right, or the, the chat right now, and people uh, might be able to grab something. But yeah, something with um, error detection is usually better. I like Visual Studio's code, um, and I think it's free. I'm pretty sure it's free. I mean, I didn't pay for it, so <laughs> I hope it's free. Um, okay, so what is going on? in this uh, JSON file. So a JSON file, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Node. It's basically, if you're familiar with Python coding, it's like a, a dict object, a dictionary. Um, and so every JSON file has keys. So these are keys, for instance. So anything in curly brackets starts a new object. And then within that object, you have to have keys. So in a map file, we have, for instance, a startup key. And within that start, that startup key itself is an object. And within that startup key, um, we have a map, a first trigger, and a flea trigger. Um, for a defense mission, we don't have a stable map. So you could specify a specific map here. Um, but instead, what we're doing is we're specifying a folder. So we're saying, look into the maps, contracts, defense folder. And there's a star here. It says any of those maps. So pick one, essentially. So that's how we're able to set contracts up to have random map selection. So this one file runs every single three-wave assault contract, but it's a different random map every time. And as long as the maps adhere to having the proper triggers, this script will work on them. Um, we'll come back to the first and the flea trigger, but then we have a mission info 
uh, object. And this just has a description. You will be guarding a local ammo dump, blah, blah, blah. Then we have a contract info object. You might recognize th uh, this stuff from the actual um, contracts themselves. So this says, Garrison duty. You are being tasked with protecting a local base from an incoming raid. We expect uh, enemy forces to attempt to raid our base, blah, blah, blah. This is the actual text that appears um, in the mission itself. And um, <sighs> contracts are so complicated. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it this way for now, and maybe we'll have time to expand it today. We might have to do a follow-up live stream at some point. But the, see how you have two descriptions. Uh, so there's like a list, and then each list has a list of texts. Um, when the game is setting up a contract, it will randomly select one of these accumulations of text, and that will be your mission description. So half the time, this mission is described as a garrison to duty. Half the time is defense of a supply depot. You could have another description here if you want. Um, you know, uh, the fun mission or something. And then you could have another description. Then, uh, you know, a third of the time it'd be garrison duty. A third of the time, defense. A third of the time... Uh, the fun mission. Um, here are some properties dictating um, how to adjust uh, advanced pay, total pay, salvage picks, salvage extra, uh, max units, and max tonnage. Different contracts have different adjustments. So the amount of advanced pay you have will be dictated partially by these ratios. Um, individual houses have their own ratios, which are applied on top. So basically, you know, if you're working for Curita, they don't do advanced pay by default, so uh, their ratio here is zero. So whatever the advanced pay is calculated out for for this contract, it's then halved by this one, by the contract-specific adjustment, but then the Curita-specific adjustment drops it to zero. Um, and so these different houses have different adjustments, you know. Uh, House Davian is always willing to send more units in. They have good logistics. So they actually have positive values here, like 1.25, 1.25. So the max units will be increased to 1.25. And then again, uh, by House Davian, 1.25 again. Um, so you can make contracts and try and adjust their difficulty by adjusting how much the contracts get uh, adjusted in terms of their pay. Um, the next property is forces, and this is where um, some of those triggers start to come in. So forces have a bunch of different properties. Um, you know, we can go through some of them today, but, you know, one thing I'm going to say over and over is that I'll kind of give you the guide and telling you where to look at and how to interpret these JSON files generally. But in terms of all the details, what I would suggest is if you dig around in some files that exist, you can get ideas of what they can do, what different properties you can play with are, because um, there's too many for me to go through them all today. But a force has a name, so this is a player force. It has a faction, so these are the player units. And factions, by the way, um, are also a key that you have to have in here. And so here are... Um, here's the, the player units. So um, in this force, the faction was player units. So down here, you have to have a player units force. This is marked as the player. So that's how the player can control these units. And this player has allies, the turrets force. So, or, sorry, the turrets faction. Here's the turrets faction. Um, the swap colors makes these, uh, these units change color to the employing house. So that's how these units are swapped. That's why turrets are colored according to the house that hired you. They have allies, the player units, um, and they are also always visible. So if you don't do that, then if you walk away from the turrets, they go invisible because you lose line of sight. Then we have enemies and so on. So you can create different factions that are allied with one another in different ways. Um, you can also have multiple forces that use the same faction. So here we just have enemies, uh, it's just a faction. They have no allies. By default, factions are hostile to each other unless you make them allies. Um, and you'll see here, you know, there's a whole bunch of different enemy forces. Wave 1, Assault 2. Wave 1, Assault 3. Wave 1, Raid 1. They're all just enemy factioned, meaning they all fall under the same banner of ownership, but they're different forces themselves. Um, okay, so the player force is the simplest one. Um, its spawn point is player spawn, and that is basically telling the game, look for a trigger called player spawn, and that's where you should actually physically place this force on the battlefield. 
So that is a trigger. Um, spawn type, um, player spaced is just a special one for players. It means, um, you know, place battle group one at one player spawn and then battle group two at another one and battle group three at another one, if you can. So kind of try to space out the units. Um, typically by default, um, what happens with uh, spawn types is you're either placing units all at the same spawn or you're exclusively placing them. So turrets, for example, um, they are placed at the turret spawn, but you don't want to have two turrets spawn at the same turret spawn point. You know, here's a turret spawn, a turret spawn, a turret spawn, and a turret spawn. So for turrets, they're exclusively spawned, meaning that once one turret is spawned at that point, other turrets generally won't be unless you run out of spaces. Um, if you don't do anything, so if we look at the enemy forces, um, let's see. So they spawn at the enemy spawn, and then there is no extra flag. So we don't say exclusive or player spaced. This, this just means spawn at an enemy spawn, and don't worry if you've other enemies have spawned there or other enemies will spawn there. Just randomly pick one. If you happen to overlap, who cares? Um, okay, what else we got here? The unit list and the crew list determines what units and crew to bring in. For players, you're generally bringing in the player mix, the player crew. Um, for turrets, um, you can specify a specific list of items to pick from. So in this case, it could be a PPC turret, a heavy LRM, or a heavy AC, and it will randomly uh, pick those. It will only pick one item, so you could have set this to four, and you would have picked a, a cluster of four turrets. Um, and then the crew, you can specify a skill level, um, and that will randomly generate uh, pilots with those skills. So you can see down here. So here's an enemy wave. So this force uh, is of the enemy faction at an enemy spawn point. You can specify its AI, which in defense missions, you want the AI to be assault, so the enemies actually approach the target building. Other AIs you can do include things like uh, guard, which is basically just idle. The enemy will just stand around. If it sees the, if it sees you, it will start chasing you. But then if you run away and hide, it will go back to where it started. Um, you can also do, um, not haunt, hunt, which means uh, the enemy force will move as a unit around the map, um, trying to hunt you down. You can do hunt solo, which means every single unit will just take off in a different direction, trying to hunt you. Um, you can also do garrison, which is like guard, where units will stand still and wait for you. But if they see you, they won't necessarily start chasing you. They'll just stare at you. And they'll shoot at you if you're in range. But as soon as you open fire on them and they get hit, then they'll start chasing you. And then if you sort of run away for a bit, they'll go back to where they... Like, they won't chase you very far. So Garrison is sort of, you know, telling the enemy, stay close to the area you're supposed to defend. Whereas Guard is saying, just... If I can spell it right. Just hang around and if you see the enemy, go nuts. Um, and then uh, I think assault was what we had here. I better not save this uh, just in case I'm making changes here. Um, you can see that this is, you know, a random force of one to two units. It's going to be units that are at least 80 to 100 tons. And these are going to be regular pilots. Um, you could set up in this list, you know, like regular and veteran. And then for each unit, it will randomly decide regular or veteran. Um, or you can just set it to, you know, one skill level. Um, and then the last thing that we'll mention as we go through this JSON file is there's this spawn event. So enemy forces on these defense missions don't all spawn at once. They kind of spawn gradually over time. And so if you add the spawn event uh, flag, then the enemies will not spawn right away. They will wait for a specific event that you have to call. Um, if we took that out, then this force would spawn right away and start moving towards the target as soon as the get the, the level starts. Um, okay, let me just check questions for a moment, make sure we're not losing anyone. Can you have multiple factions free-for-all style? You definitely can. And so you can set up um, you know, three or four different factions and they will all just fight each other. So you could create a huge, like, uh, free-for-all battle if you want, um, which I did in testing and it was pretty cool. I just haven't uh, done it for any contracts because um, the one problem with that is how do you prevent the player from just hanging back and letting the enemy forces wipe, wipe each other out? Uh, but you could do it. There's no reason you can't and it's fun. 
Um, okay, let's jump to triggers for a second. We'll come back to events. So triggers, these exist in uh, battle maps, in RPG maps, in everything. And they form the backbone of how you make things happen in this game. Um, so any JSON file that is running a map um, needs, well, it doesn't need to, but it should have a triggers uh, dictionary. And in that dictionary, you're going to have a list of um Essentially, you can think of these sort of like functions because um, they can do all sorts of different things. You can make a prompt appear. You can do actions, which do calculations and checks on game variables. You can have if-then statements and all sorts of stuff. And like, honestly, 90% of what you see when you play Battlemarks is triggers in action. So most of the game that you see, I've programmed in these triggers. Um, so there's not a lot of sort of hard-coded stuff in the game. Um, okay, so first of all, um, let's see how these map triggers interact with our triggers in our map. So we had triggers like an evac zone. How does the game, how does that work? Like if a unit gets to the evac zone, what actually happens in the game code? Well, if you look in here, um, there's a trigger called evac zone. And this, and map triggers are called anytime a unit walks into them in the game. So this is true in the RPG segments too. If we open up, um, let me actually grab an RPG map here. Um, let's see, maps, planets. Um, let's just do, uh, sure, a temperate one. So here is um, one of the maps in the game. You land here. Notice there's a starport spawn trigger and a starport. Um, so when you, when you're playing the game and you're walking around and you walk up to the starport, the reason the game knows to bring up the starport menu when you walk into this area is because there's a map trigger called starport. And when your unit physically walks into this in the game, the game calls the starport trigger that exists in its JSON data. And so we can look at that starport data in a little bit. You can see like, how does it know what prompt to bring up and how do you specify what it should look like? Um, and so for the evac zone in battle maps, anytime a unit walks into an evac zone, an evac zone, th this trigger right here is triggered. And so what does this trigger do? Well, it, it's an if it's an if check. Um, in this case, uh, we're checking if. Um, so if statements in this game can be like a, a single uh, statement. So you can just say check if the building count is less than or equal to zero. You can also do ands and ors. And the way this is dealt with in the JSON data is you pass in a list and the first list has to say and or or not or something like that. Um, and in this case, it's an and check. So the if statement's going to check these two things. And if they're both true, then it's going to do an action. So this is if the mission building count is less than or equal to zero and the triggering unit, so the unit that walked into this evac zone, um, if its faction name is equal to enemy. So again, up here, you know, here's the name of a faction. And so any enemy unit, their faction name will be enemy. Um, so if both of these things are true, then deactivate the unit. So in these defense maps, after enemies come and swarm you, if they destroy the target building, then the mission building count goes down to zero, and then the enemies try to flee. And so when both of those things are true, it's an enemy that's in the evac zone and the building has been destroyed, then when the enemy gets there, you can deactivate them, which means take them off the map. So that's how enemies are fleeing in the, def in the defense missions. Um, so here's the action, deactivate the unit. Um, the way this game works with action uh, actions is that every action typically has some arguments or args that are passed along. And sometimes they're just a string, but sometimes it's an object that has other properties. So in this case, to deactivate a unit, you have to say which unit type you're deactivating. And you have to say, what kind of deactivation is this? Is it a flea? Is it destruction? Something like that. So in this case, the, enemy, the unit is um, fleeing. Uh, yeah, somebody says, is this being recorded? It definitely is. I know this is a lot. You might have to go back and watch this multiple times. So I'm going to record this, upload it. You can watch it to your heart's content. Um, because, yeah, a one-time live stream event doesn't work for passing on info. Because I know this will take some time for you guys to wrap your heads around. Um, okay, so that's the evac zone. Uh, and really, you know, in these defense missions, 
the evac zone is the only trigger itself that uh, is, uh, where were we? It's the only trigger itself that is uh, going to modify anything. Um, what did I change here? Hold on, edit, undo. Okay, I'm just going to close this map. I really don't want to <laughs> mess up my maps through showing you guys what we're doing. Anyway, um, yeah, so in the battle, those triggers are the only triggers that do anything. We'll look at an RPG map next just to give you more um, ideas on how those work. But the other big thing besides triggers that exist are events. So events are basically triggers that happen when something um, happens. So is there an API doc for all the actions? What are the valid actions? There is not an, an existing doc at the moment. And that's one of the things, again, that uh, I unfortunately don't have time to write on out because it would take hours and hours. But I want to try and show you guys as many actions as I can in the scripts and show you how to read the scripts. And then hopefully you can go in and see all sorts of other actions. And hopefully people can add these to uh, to our growing manual on the Discord. Uh, and I can certainly weigh in and try and add some stuff. But there's not, unfortunately, a single uh, unified spot where I was adding this. Uh, hindsight's 2020. Should have been doing it the whole time. Um, okay, so events are things that happen. So for a typical, the most common events are things like time has passed or a unit has fled, a unit is destroyed. So these are special triggers that get called by the game's engine when certain things happen. Um, so time is something that gets called every once a second. Um, and you can, uh, there's a game variable called time that gets updated every time the time thing is called. So you can just check to see is time greater than five? Um, if so, then do an action. In this case, we're going to call another trigger called wave one. Um, so action, so trigger is an action you can call and it will just call another trigger and you just tell it which trigger to call. Um, this clear when just means that once this has been, uh, dealt with, erase it so that it doesn't keep getting called over and over and over again. So you don't just keep calling wave one every time time is greater than five because, after five seconds, it'll call once. You don't want it to call repeatedly. Um, so this is how the game sort of doles out the enemy forces. Uh, there's wave one, two, and three. And um, so these are triggers that are getting called at certain intervals uh, over time. Um, there's other actions like a unit has fled, a unit is destroyed, unit damaged is another one. So when a unit is damaged, you can check to see, um, you know, check properties of it and do certain triggers if you want. So... Unit fled. If enemy count is less than zero, then trigger defense failed. Um, so that just means if all the enemies get away, then call the trigger that will end the map. Um, if a unit is destroyed, if the player count is less than zero, then that pretty much was the last player unit, then call the trigger mission failed. Um, if enemy count is less than zero or less than or equal to zero and the building count is still greater than zero, then mission success. So a unit was destroyed. There's no enemies left. The target building is left. It must be a success. So these are just some if checks to figure out, you know, when certain, when units are destroyed or somebody flees, you know, check to see what kind of event should you do in response. Um, and then here's an interesting one with a few actions because somebody was just asking, what are some actions you can do? Um, so, um, a unit was destroyed, um, the triggering unit, so the unit that actually was destroyed is the mission target, so it's a defense building, and there's no more buildings left, so you could have multiple defending buildings that you gotta defend, so like two or three, um, and this would still work, but when there's no more buildings left, then, in this case, so rather than do one action, you know, we've just been doing one action if the if statement is true so far. You can actually do a list of actions, and that's passed with the actions keyword. And then now, rather than doing one thing, you can do a bunch of things. And you can have other if checks within each of these. So you can get really complicated with your logic. And I'll try to show off at least one trigger that does some complicated logic stuff um, when we get to the general triggers. But if you've played the defense missions, you know that when your building gets destroyed, it scrolls to the evac zone. So there's action, scroll to, arguments, evac zone. So it looks for the, the trigger evac zone, scrolls there. Action, uh, trigger, 
So it calls another trigger called defense fail now flee. We'll look at that in a second. And then it does another action. It issues an order. And this is a complex act action. So rather than a string, it passes an object. And so for issuing an order, you issue that order to a faction. So all the enemies. Uh, the order is move to. So that's the change in their AI. And the destination is evac zone. So all the enemies will drop what they're doing and start running to the evac zone. Um, there's other orders you can do here. Uh, a soft move is tell the enemy to move to a to a place, but if they encounter an, a, a target along the way, if they see a player, they can stop moving and start attacking the player instead. So a soft move is like move, but engage the enemy. Move to is like get your butt there. Do not engage the enemy, just go. So move is kind of like a hard move. Um, other things you could do, um, you can change their AI to whatever you want. So you can change their AI to guard or hunt solo or all sorts of stuff. So any of the AIs that I mentioned above, um, let's make sure we undo all this stuff. There we go. It's gonna undo everything that I did today. <laughs> okay. Um, everything that I mentioned above in terms of possible AIs that you can give to enemies, you can give as an order in the middle of a, uh, a mission for some reason if you want. Um, Okay, so when enemies are destroyed and we are fleeing, so like defense failed, um, defense failed, now flee. You say, okay, I'm going to look down in the triggers and we have defense fail, now flee. We have defense evac prompt. Uh, where's defense failed? Where's mission success? Some triggers are missing here. What the heck gives? Right, like defense fail, now flee. Um, it, it makes, so here's one other trigger that's interesting is trigger visible. This means take a map trigger like evac zone and make it actually visible with a sprite. And so that's how triggers are able to suddenly look like red zones or green zones is we're calling a game sprite to make them visible. Um, and then we have defense evacs uh, prompt. So here's, here's another trigger that will get called. Action, trigger, defense evac prompt. So it will literally call this trigger next and this trigger is more than just actions. Now we have a prompt. So this is a type, a prompt. You can have a prompt or a sub prompt. We'll cover them. We talk more about the RPG stuff. Size, if you just give a single number, that's the width of the prompt. Otherwise you can give, you know, a size and height if you want as a list. Um, here's the text that gets shown. The target building collapses. The evac zones have been marked on the map. Enemy forces are now fleeing. And then you have some options. In this case, one option, it says, okay. And when you click OK, it does an action, scrolls to the player group. Uh, so basically, you've scrolled to the evac zone to show this message. When you click OK, it will scroll back to the player. Um, so even um, options in prompts can have actions. And um, they can have if statements and stuff as well. Um, but OK, so some triggers seem to be missing. We had up here, um, you know, mission success. Where the heck is mission success? It's not here, right? Well, there's one other thing you can do in these JSONs. Um, and actually, I guess it's included automatically, but I'll show you a map where it's not automatic. Um, let's see here. Scripts. Um, actually, sorry, maps, where we want it. Uh, planets. <clears throat> So let's grab an RPG one. Here's the include keyword, and you can actually include other scripts in your script. And so basically what would happen is this script would get, get read in and any triggers it has will get added to this current script. Um, and for battle maps, I guess I made it automatic so you didn't have to add it every time. But there is a script called general uh, mission triggers scripts. Uh, where did I put it? Not there. Missions. General mission triggers. And mission success. So, you know, this, uh, this assault map here, it's including the triggers it needs specifically, but it, it also calls on some general triggers. So like for instance, mission success and defense failed. 
um, these general mission triggers get loaded into every single mission and you can use them. So mission success will bring up a prompt um, where you can't press escape and get away from it. You have to click one of the options to proceed. And it says mission completed successfully. There's only one option. The text for that option says return to starport. And when you select it, it does an action called new RPG. Um, and this is how you transition out of the battle into an RPG segment with this new RPG keyword uh, action. So for the arguments, the map that we're going to use is actually the last map. So we're not telling it to use a specific map. We're saying go back to the previous map we were using, go back to the previous script, basically return to the RPG that we had before. And for that previous map script, modify it to basically include for it um, this contract success JSON data, which we can look at in a bit. Um, here are other uh, other triggers that are included in every map, even if it's not an assault or defense or whatever, but they can be used by any. Um, so assault success, um, assault su success but died, um, you know, diversion, killed enemy. So a lot of these are prompts that will say certain things. So you can dig into this general mission trigger stuff if you want to see, you know, the convoy ones are particularly interesting because they set up a number of variables and they issue some orders and stuff. Uh, convoys are set to move at a specific speed, so there's even uh, a trigger for modifying uh, unit stat. So modify unit stat, modify the stat of speed, and set it to four so that all units move at a constant pace and things like that. Um, I was trying to see if there's anything else specific in here. Yeah, and there's, so if you fail at, uh, you have a half success in the intercept missions, it can actually go in and modify your reimbursements from your uh, contract and stuff like that. So digging around in this JSON file will give you some ideas of some of the things you can do. A lot of these general mission triggers just sort of check enemy counts. If there's a success or failure, they'll move you back to the uh, RPG in a different way. Um, okay. Let's take a look. I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna close this. Let's take a look now at, um, so this is player spawn. Let's take a look at some RPG map stuff, I think. Um, so I'm going to start to close some of these things. Yeah, my concern is I'm going to like modify a map on stream and not realize it and save it. And then the next update, uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, some sort of like glitch or something because I left something open. Um, let's grab the Pacifica map because there's some cool stuff in there. And actually, um, let's see how much of, oops, how much of our timeshare have we gone through so far here? So let's see. Okay. Tiled and tile sets. I think that's all we're really going to say about the maps specifically in terms of editing and then map triggers. We've kind of explained those. Oh, I will mention debug mode shortly. But uh, let's talk a little about these RPG segment uh, items. Oops, okay. And people have been quiet in the chat. Have I put everyone to sleep? Is anyone alive out there still? Hello, hello, hello. Let me know. You, just say something so I know that uh, still going through. Are you not using Git? Uh, nope. <laughs> you can judge me. Um, but, uh, every, I have everything backed up in a Google drive. So anytime a file changes, I get different versions. So, um, it's only been like once or twice I've had to revert. Okay. People are commenting. So everyone's just watching with bated breath. So that's okay. Um, all right. So let's grab the Pacifica Citadel map. Uh, cause this one does a lot of interesting mods. Okay. So here's the Pacifica map. Um, you can see a lot of areas are blocked off. You can see there are some spawn points um, and, you know, uh, the starport and Comstar and the mech bay and all sorts of um, other stuff. So let's see. Um, let's grab the JSON data from this. And we're going to toss it in here. Let close this down. Okay, so, or actually, you know what? Let's start with, so now that you're kind of getting familiar with Jason, um, so every campaign 
uh, is just a folder. And in that folder, there needs to be a startup JSON file. And that file uh, dictates everything about how this campaign should uh, be described and start up. So in the startup JSON file, you have a name, a description, and a splash. So when you know you go into the game itself um, and you see the Crescent Hawks legacy, you see this image and you see this description, that is literally these three variables just being shown. Name, description, and splash. And for splash, it says look in images slash splash. And basically that's saying, look in the tr first try the images folder of the Crescent Hawks. And then here's the splash screen right there. So that's the image that, that gets shown. Um, for uh, a campaign, you have to have a first trigger. And this is basically the first trigger that will get called when the campaign is selected. And then you have to have triggers. Um, and that's how, you know, when you start a campaign, um, you start it up. Are there custom properties on the tiles in RPG maps? Um, good question. There is just one or two. Um, so before we dive into that, Jason, let me just answer this question that was brought up in the chat. So we want, I think it's Pacifica new that we're using. Um, so if you pay attention in the Pacifica maps, when you're walking around, if you walk through the forest, your lower half of your body disappears, uh, sort of a little DOS era effect. There's a draw upper only flag you can add to tiles if you want. Um, other than that, there's not really any, I think I don't even have solid. I think you just map it out with blocks. Um, and let me verify that with, just grabbing another RPG map here real quick. Maps, planets, Yeah, so when you draw your RPG maps, you do have to sort of manually block it off. I might update that so you can add a, a block property to the tiles themselves, but that's how they're operating right now. Um, the RPG maps, I designed them way early in the process, and I haven't actually updated how they work in a really long time. So that was that's actually a bit of an oversight. But anyway, for now, you have to manually block off the areas that can't be walked on. Um, okay... How resilient is your engine? If you make an error in your coding, does the game crash out? Um, it's not crazy resilient. Um, so it will typically crash if your JSON file is invalid or um, if you're missing triggers and stuff, events just won't happen. So that's not a problem. But if you have like invalid JSON files or you're trying to use like a spawn point that truly doesn't exist, it can error out. Uh, when it does error out, if you look in the console, so this is like your game window. You'll have a console in the background that's pumping out uh, messages as the game runs. Um, if you look in that console, we'll usually tell you what file or what function at least caused the error, and then you can track it down usually pretty easily, but um, it may take a bit of getting used to. Um, and somebody said, yeah, custom properties. Um, okay, so in the triggers, uh, so the first trigger for this campaign is startup. So once you uh, select this campaign, uh, all the triggers get loaded in, then the startup action is performed, or the startup trigger is called, and this trigger has a list of actions. So first it sets up a number of base files that the game needs. So these are basically like the battle unit selection file. So this is a JSON file that describes when you click a unit in battle, what does that lower bar across the screen look like? Um, and if you were to go open it up, if you say, huh, I didn't know you could modify that. Well, indeed you can. So if you look in the scripts, uh, frames, then we'll have is it battle unit selection. So battle unit selection. Uh, oops, drag it in. So this is, you know, the some of these, you know, battle unit selection and battle unit setup screens are the most complex kinds of prompts you can make in the game. So if you do want to like go and like see an example of something that's doing a lot, you can go in here. But for instance, uh, you know, this positions itself on the screen. So 560 pixels down. So this is the bar that runs along the bottom of the screen. And then within this frame or within this, uh, you know, prompt, there's a whole bunch of different frames. And so each frame has a different position and some have borders and some don't. They have different sizes and background colors. They show different texts. And so for instance, um, 
rather you know you could show a text like you know um my mac oops and then this would literally show the text my mac on the screen but if you want to show a game variable you can just include that in squirrely brackets and then this will actually pull the game engine and try and pull in this case the selected unit's name um and you can see selected unit is going to show up a lot in this because when you select a unit all the info on the bottom needs to be reflective of the unit you've got selected. So there is an internal game variable called selected unit that you have access to, and you can get the pilot's call sign, the pilot's experience description. Are they veteran? Are they green? You can get the uh, pilot's health, you know, and then you start to get into the unit. Is it overheated? If so, draw this. Uh, draw this if it's not overheated, you know, draw, um, you know, this if it, so if the selected unit has a jump time greater than zero, meaning it has jump jets, then draw a jump jet button. Um, and the jump jet button will have properties like uh, modify this variable um, based on its activity. And so, again, we don't have enough time today to dive into all of this, but going in and kind of looking at what these things are doing, if you have played the game and sort of understand what you see there and what you can do, you can go and see, oh, there's buttons and you can assign a button a variable. There's sliders that display armor and internal and you can set a value and a maximum and number of segments so number of like dash segments and stuff you can specify different colors and all sorts of stuff you can grab um you know unit weapons so grab the unit weapon for the selected unit weapon eight weapon nine weapon seven weapon six so these are the buttons that you can click to like make the weapon active or inactive so if you make a custom campaign and you want the unit selection to look totally different you want it to be on the left side of the screen and all sorts of different buttons and stuff in different orders you can totally do that it's just all done with json files it just takes a while to write the file um battle enemy selection this is what happens when you select an enemy what do you see uh, the battle status bar, this is in this, in, in the default game, it's the bar on the left side of the screen. Um, RPG status, that's the bar along the very top of the screen that shows you what planet you're on, what year it is, how much money you have. Um, the star map file, this is the star map file to load in by default. Um, in terms of, so this is in the data and then star map 3025 file. So if you come in here, you'll have different star map files. If we load in 3025, this is a JSON file, right? So get really comfortable with JSON files if you want to like make your own stuff in this game. But the star map specifies like what kind of contracts there are, what kind of factions exist, uh, what planets there are, what the planet's name is, what kind of icons they use, what kind of contract template they should be referring to. And you had contract templates up here, which specify, you know, uh, what kind of enemies you're going against, what are their skills, how much pay, how much salvage, um, you know, which uh, actual contract files to pull from for this kind of contract. So for a uh, periphery easy mission, you're not going to see any assault uh, missions in here. Uh, well, I mean, you'll see an assault mission against light mechs, but you're not going to see any missions against like assault class mechs. But if you get down to like, you know, border, border hard, then the missions that are being pulled are all like heavy and assault uh, style missions. So the planet file will dictate what kind of planets are available. Um, the star map file, I guess I should say. Um, and, you know, when a planet is selected for travel, it has an action. And the action is start a new RPG on this planet with this JSON file. So the planets themselves aren't like super special in that you know they they have some kind of internal code that makes them makes you travel from one planet to the next what's happening when you're selecting a planet in the star map and clicking travel is the game is literally just going into the star map and whatever action happens to be here is the one that is called it just so happens that they're all every action is start a new rpg segment and use this map and this json file so here's alshane it's a factory map or factory planet so we're going to load the small temperate map, but we're going to apply the factory planet JSON triggers to it. Here's a MIDI. It is a border world. So we're going to we're going to use the exact same map that we just used here, temperate, but now we're going to apply um, a different uh, set of JSON data to it. And so it's like you're using the same map, but you get different scripting outcomes because you're applying different triggers and stuff to the map. So um, that's how the planets work. 
Um, let's see. Um, by the way, if you're looking through this code and you see action args, then you see x action and x args, you may say, huh, I wonder what the x action does. That's my way of commenting it out. If the game encounters a, tr a keyword it doesn't understand, it skips it. So you can see, in this case, I'm using a trigger called lock mod star map, which is basically just used to add the specifica data into the star map file. And I previously was removing earth. I just commented that out because I, I reverted that in one of my um, updates. But if you're ever looking through my JSON data and you see all these X marked things, those are things that I essentially commented out. And so they're not being applied in the game. They're not like some special X action that exists in the game. Um, okay. Uh, so if you keep going in the startup, it does some other housekeeping. Um, it sets up uh, a newsnet list. It loads in news stories. It creates, uh, it sets the current planet to Pacifica. It sets money to zero, owed money to zero, meaning you don't start in debt. It uh, updates the game year. It sets up a trigger that gets called on the date change. So this is a special, when the date changes, call this trigger, update star map. And that's how the game, the update star map trigger, when we look at it, that is just checking what year it is. And if it's 3030, then it updates the star map to 3030. If it's 3039, it updates the star map to 3039. So it's just a trigger that constantly checks what the year is. And when a certain year is passed, it changes the star map. If you wanted to make a different star map for every year of the inner sphere, you can just modify this trigger and have more specific, uh, faster paced changes in the overall star map. Uh, and that's all it takes to do that. Um, it then creates a player crew, a mech, a player mechs list. Um, it adds Jason Youngblood to the player crew list. So this is a very specific trigger with a lot of details because we're adding, you know, very specific unit that we're making up. Um, we're setting the mercenary name to Crescent Hawk. So uh, we do all this housekeeping, get the game all ready. And then we perform our first action, which is to launch a new RPG. And we're going to go to the Pacifica Citadel map. So that's how come we start. When you start this campaign, you start on that map. And... Um, if you don't specify a script, so over here, you know, when we're calling new RPG, here's a map and here's a script to use. Uh, here's a map and then here's a script to use. If you just call a map and you don't specify a script, the game will look for a JSON file that has the same name as the map in the same place as the map. So for instance, if this script part didn't exist, the game would load the small desert TMX map, and then it would look for maps, planet, small desert, JSON. Um, and it would try to load that JSON. And it might crash if there's no JSON there. Um, in our case, we have a map file, but we did specify a script file. So what does the game do? Well, it says, okay, well, I know that I need to go into the maps folder and I should find a Pacifica Citadel.json file. And that's right here. And so this is loaded as the default JSON. So you can load a map and specify a different script file to overwrite the default. If you don't, then it just loads that map's corresponding JSON file by default. Now, the default Citadel JSON uh, script has all sorts of default things, but how do we set up like, oh, you're at the beginning of training or now you're at the end of training or, and stuff like that? Well, we do that with mods. So you can specify a script or not, and you can also specify mods. And these are files that get overlaid on top of the JSON data. So for instance, here's um, a JSON file, Pacifica Citadel Mission 1. What this will do is it will come in here and find Pacifica Citadel Mission 1. And this is just a very small JSON file that uh, has a training ready trigger. And this is going to modify the Pacifica Citadel's training ready trigger. Meaning that if the Pacifica Citadel doesn't have a training ready uh, trigger, then this one will be it. And if it already has one, well, then this one's still going to be it. This is going to override it. So when you mod a map, if you add mods, they get overlaid on top of an existing file and they will either override or add to it. So if we look at, let's see, training ready. Let's just look for it over here. Uh, whoops. Let's see, training 
ready. Okay. Well, actually, it doesn't exist in the default one, so there you go. Um, but what are some other mods here? I know one of these overwrites stuff. Um, okay, so the mission ready. Let's see. Um, mission ready. Okay. So here, oops. Here's some triggers. Training confirm, uh, star map check, and check Merc contracts. And so star map check says you should finish your training before you head off world. And check Merc contract says you should finish your training before you think about taking a contract. If you look in the Pacifica JSON uh, stuff, so if we go come in here, and, okay, why is it doing that? Huh. I swear I thought it overrode it. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, oh, it's in the CHI general? No. Anyway, um, by default, when you walk over to the starport, uh, the game will call a trigger called um, uh, the, uh, well, we had it right over here. What is it? It will call star map check when you walk over here um, and you try and like leave the planet. And by default, star map check is going to bring up the star map and let you choose a planet to leave and go wherever you want. But when you're training in Pacifica, you're not supposed to be able to leave yet. So we actually overwrite that star map check with this one that says you should think about your training and you can't leave yet. So basically we overwrite part of the mission trigger so that people can't leave. Um, and that's how we can modify a map so that it behaves in different ways, you know, at depending on different circumstances. Um, anyway, there's a few other mods that get applied here. The welcome JSON file just shows a couple of different uh, uh, text uh, boxes like prompts. So in this game, the text boxes are called prompts. Um, and so, for instance, the first trigger is the welcome prompt. So the welcome prompt will show up. It's a prompt, and it will say, you know, um, well, it's it's a background jump ship. So the, the actual welcome prompt is just that background jump ship. And once this prompt appears, it calls an action, which is the welcome message. And this is a sub prompt. Sub prompts will appear on top of a prompt. A prompt erases everything that exists and starts as like a fresh window. So prompts and subprompts are a little different. A subprompt always goes on top, leaves whatever prompt called it up behind it, um, whereas uh, a subprompt, uh, I'm losing track of my sentence here. So for instance, let's just go into this. So this window back here, the background image, that is a prompt. This one here is a subprompt. And that's our welcome message. And when we click OK, what's going to happen is all the sub prompts are going to close and then the tutorial question will come up. And this is a sub prompt. So watch what happens when we click OK. All the sub prompts will close, which is just this, but not the image behind because the image is a prompt. So I click OK. Now I get a sub prompt and I can skip this. Um, other examples of sub prompts are like when you come in here, this is a prompt. But when you say, um, you know, what mechs do you have for sale? This is actually a sub prompt that's overlaying everything on top. And if I press escape, then I go back to the previous prompt. Uh, maybe a more obvious uh, sub prompt would be in here. This is a prompt right here. If I click shop for weapons, this is a sub prompt. So you can see the sub prompt is being drawn over top. The prompt is now inactive, but the prompt is still showing up. And then when I close the sub prompt, it goes back to the prompt. Um, and then you can leave. So prompts and sub prompts are slightly different. Um, and then here's another example of, um, actually, I guess it doesn't work in the menus anyway. Um, so that's prompts and sub prompts. Um, coming back over here. Uh, startup. Okay. So anyway, we call a new RPG, Pacifica Citadel map, Pacifica Citadel Jason's going to get called. All these mods are going to be applied over top. The Pacifica Citadel JSON file is going to include the general RPG triggers. Um, oh, and this is where we had the star map check. That's right. Um, so general RPG triggers are a massive resource that has all sorts of triggers and pretty much everything you can imagine. So that one, if you do decide to go looking in it, it will take you a while uh, to parse out. But it's in here and general RPG. So just like we had general map triggers, we have general 
RPG triggers. So for instance, the escape menu. When you press escape in this game and you bring up um, this menu, this is a trigger. And you could make a campaign that has a different options menu if you want. You could leave it the same, uh, but you can make your own. So uh, in this, you know, we have a status, options, save game, load game, shortcut keys, etc. If you click on shortcut keys and it's a prompt, its text comes from, um, you know, this text file. And then uh, it has a button that says more. When you click it, it calls a trigger that's shortcut keys battle one. Here's shortcut keys battle one. It's a prompt. Here's its size. So basically triggers tend to be collections of actions or prompts or both. You can definitely mix both in the same. So a lot of these, a lot of the general RPG one, if you scroll through, they're going to be different prompts that will show different things. Variables are shown in squirrely brackets. You can get a sense of what variables you can present uh, by just, going and trying to find a screen. So, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, if you come in and you say, you know, what mechs have you got for sale? You may say, you know, how, how does the game know how to display these different properties of this particular unit? Um, well, you can find that all in these files. So uh, we can look for um, what mechs do you have for sale? That calls a trigger called Mech Market. Okay, so what happens at Mech Market? Um, well, this pulls up a sub prompt and it shows an image in the corner. That's these guys, these completely trustworthy businessmen here. And then, okay, so that's that frame. Here's another frame. It says Mechs for Sale. So that's this. Okay, so then what's in that Mechs for Sale uh, frame? Well, we have a list and this list is an item list. And its text is going to be item get name. And the text on the right is item get cost, some math here and C bills. So we can see that that's, oh, this is the result of item get name. This is the result of that math. Um, when you select it, when you select an item, it goes to check by mech. Um, you know, so if we go into check by mech, we can see, oh, it does some actions. It checks to see if you know, we have enough money. Um, and then if we do, it goes to confirm by mech. So you can sort of follow these triggers along and sort of see like, okay, in, in Jay's JSON files, how does his mech market work? And how does this work? And you can uh, try and pick up uh, hopefully some ways of setting things up. And what I'd recommend is start by copying, you know, like if you want to make your own campaign, copy all the triggers and stuff that I've set up uh, in your own folder and then start modifying little things here and there and see if you get the outcomes that you wanted. And if something breaks, just revert it back to how I had it, drop a question in the Discord, and we can usually help you out, um, help you figure out what's going on. So yeah, there's lots. The, the general RPG um, JSON file contains triggers for literally everything. So if it's RPG related, it's almost always here. Um, okay, let me just refer back to this real quick um okay so let me talk a little about this heist thing and then debug i mean we've kind of talked about this stuff already we're not necessarily going in a particular order but uh okay let's bring up where's my pacifica stuff pacifica citadel Okay, what else happens in these maps, these RPG map JSON files? Um, you need a player spawn. So we need to know where to spawn the player. Number of NPCs. This is a number of sort of people just walking around the starport. I found you don't want to make this too huge or the game lags um, because there's too much constant pathfinding checks going on. I, I might try and fix that in future because it's just an inefficiency problem, but it's not essential. So it's been low on my to-do list. Um, refresh trigger is what this map should call every time it's reloaded. So if you recalled in the battle JSON files, when a battle was over, it said load a new RPG and the map you should use is the last map and the script you should use is the last script. Well, when that script comes up, it calls a refresh trigger because it says, okay, I'm not being loaded for the first time. So it's not a startup script, but it's a refresh script. So I need to refresh a few things. Um, so this is just a trigger that you will find below in the um, triggers section. So here's the startup 
and it's just some actions. Again, actions X, that means I commented it out, so those aren't being performed. Instead, these are being performed. Um, so it's just setting some uh, buy ratio, sell ratios, as I can control prices on planets, wager limits. Um, okay. A few other things that happen at the beginning of an RPG map. RPG maps sort of front load a lot of their data so that they kind of like preload a lot of things they need. So for instance, the list of mechs for sale is a list that gets generated once a map is loaded initially. So here's our for sale list. And we're generating a unit list. Um, and special house means draw from prevalent mechs um, in a specific faction. So for instance... Um, so if I am on a Steiner world, then um, I should draw uh, mechs that Steiner would use. And that means 50% of the time, I'm just going to draw a generally available mech. And 50% of the time, I will draw a mech that is listed as prevalent um, for the Steiner faction. So if I pop over real quick to the uh, data units... 3025 IS prevalent Steiner. Oh, there's a text file here. And it tells me that these are prevalent Steiner mechs. So 50% of the time, one of these mechs will get selected. 50% of the time, instead, it will just select from the available list of mechs. And so it will be one of these mechs. If I was on a curator planet, it would draw from the curator list 50% of the time. And 50% of the time, this general list. Um, if you are a modder, you can make a new text file here and add other mech names here. You don't have to edit this file. This file you can leave as is. You can put as many text files as you want in here. The game reads all the text files and just adds them all to the available list. Same with the prevalent list. You never need to edit the prevalent list I've created. If you want to add more mechs, just create a new text file and throw it in there and that will work. Um, Okay, so that's, you know, we're going to draw some house-specific mechs. Three to six mechs will be for sale. Uh, at maximum, there will be 25 tons on Pacifica, because Pacifica, if you played Crescent Hawks Inception, has really light mechs. Cost ratio is like, what should these things be priced? 1.0 means price them as their blue book value. Uh, a price of two means double their blue book value. 0.5 means half their blue book value. When we have two values like this, you're telling the game to randomly select between these two numbers. If you have two whole numbers, like zero and one, the game will select a random integer. So we'll select either zero or one. If you had zero through five, it would be zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, if you have decimals, though, it will select a random decimal. So 0 0.9, 0 0.92, 0 0.95, 0 0.97, 1.05, 1.07, 1 all the way up to 1.1. 1 .1. So adding decimals is how you tell it to randomly select decimals. You could have a hard price ratio. Maybe all mechs on Pacifica are exactly 75% off of their blue book value. So you could have a custom cost, and ra uh, cost ratio. You can also provide bigger lists. So if you just have two items, the game will randomly select between those two. But let's say that you want to have, uh, you know, for like 90% of the time, things are 1.1 times their value. And then once in a blue moon, things are three times their value. So you could do this. And so if the game gets a list of more than two numbers, it will treat it as I should randomly select a number from this list rather than a number between anything. So there's a couple different ways to specify, you know, like what kind of randomness do you want out of a list from the game? One number, it's always that number. Two numbers, it's always between those two numbers. If they're integers, it treats it as an integer. If they're decimals, it treats it as a decimal. And if you have more than two numbers, it treats it as select one of these numbers. Um, and then same with damage. Damage is how much should the damage should these mechs have uh, ahead of time. Um, and this is 75%. Uh, so this is essentially mechs should be completely healthy. So one, or they should suffer, uh, they should be down by 75% of their... Oh, no, wait, maybe it's the other way around. I, th I think it is. I think it's one means they've taken 100% damage and 0 0.75, 75% of the damage. Um... Zero and one. I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah, that is. Yep. Um, because I can see for the mechs that you can rent for arenas, 
um, you either get mechs that have zero damage all the way up to 25% of their damage. And so the way the game calculates their damage is it adds up their internal and their armor max, and it just says, okay, this mech has 400 hit points. I was told to do 25% damage to it, so I'm going to start randomly selecting weapons and hitting the mech until 25% of its health is gone. Um, and if I score critical hits or ammo explosions, the mech's going to take extra damage. So, you know, 0 to 0.25 may not seem like a lot. It might just be 25% of the armor is gone, or it might be like the mech got cored <laughs> accidentally. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and so here's, you know, a list of black market mechs, zero to six are available. Um, and notice the special flag is missing here, meaning it will be, it won't necessarily pull prevalent mechs from the house planet that you're on. Uh, here are rental mechs, training guards, just a test group that I left in. So if you, if you want, rather than, you know, just saying minimum and maximum tons and stuff, you can actually specify a specific list of items. You could say an Atlas, a Marauder, and a Warhammer. So you could specify the exact items that you want if you want. Um, and let's see what else we got. Uh, tech for sale, that's just like equipment, like lasers and stuff, and then crew for hire. Um, so those lists all get generated at the beginning of a map or whenever it refreshes. Um, then we also need to prep some maps. We need to prep some betting maps, some rental maps, some arena maps, and some contract maps. Um, and for contract maps, it looks at the current planet that we're on, and it looks at what kind of contracts it's supposed to load. And so again, if you come to any particular planet, like, uh, let's see, let's find a planet, Alshane. Its contract template is the border world normal. So you come to the border normal and you can see that, okay, here's a bunch of properties about these kinds of contracts and here are the files that it draws from. So there's a big list of files and any one of these can be used for a, uh, uh, a contract that for a planet that has this template. And so what this list is going to do over here is it's going to go into the current planet, the contracts, go into the files and it's going to like randomly select out of those files to make one to six contracts. Um, so that's how you can control the contracts. Uh, and again, you know, some of this, you might have to play with it to fully wrap your head around it. If it seems a little complicated, it's because it's designed to be flexible, but again, use what I've got and modify it if you need to. Um, you have permission to do that if you're making your custom campaigns go nuts and then just sort of modify from my base because you know my base works and then sort of build off of that um building triggers this is just purely for the npc's benefit if this didn't exist the npcs would walk around they'd never enter a building by adding building triggers you're just telling the the game that um that you know starport comstar mech bay um you know these are triggers that um are buildings and so if an NPC walks on them, they should enter the building and be in there for a little bit and then leave. So this is just purely for aesthetics. If this isn't in the game or you specify all triggers, what will happen is an NPC could walk on a spawn point, like player spawn, and then they would enter that building. Um, and so that would, uh, you know, kind of create a, a, a problem. So uh, you need if you're going to specify triggers, you should specify ones that are actually buildings uh, for building triggers. It has no effect on gameplay for the player, though. Um, somebody said a never list. Uh, Jay, is there a way to remove mechs from the prevalent list? Um, the way you remove mechs from the prevalent list right now is you would update the star map. So in the general RPG, um, I said that uh, we set up um, gate game date change as a trigger or what was it just uh date change on date change uh hold on i forget the name of it so here's update star map update star map was a trigger that was called on date change and what it does is it performs a bunch a bunch of checks and it checks to see if it needs to show the you know if, if we enter the year 3030 it shows a little blurb a little news blurb updating it and then it will go ahead and it will update our star map. The star maps are how you would change the prevalent and available units easily. There's no other trigger to do that right now. Um, but, you know, if it's something that people need to make really cool campaigns, we can always add it, but it's just nothing in there right now. 
Um, so you could, uh, you know, you could make different star maps for different years and you could play around with the prevalent units on any given year if you want to sort of play around with mechs that will show up. Um, okay. So the only other stuff in these JSON files here are, you know, uh, just a bunch of prompts dealing with you enter, you know, uh, the training facility, you know, it should set up different missions and stuff. Um, oh, we'll show you the heist in a second. Um, okay, hold on. We want to do the heist, um, launching a battle, and oh yeah, one other thing. So mech market, the heist, launching a battle, and uh, where is it? Mech market. Um, the one other thing, so the mech for sale market that we saw here, that is uh, showing you the mechs for sale. Um, I said that, you know, this is how you could, you know, the, the item is how you, referencing the item variables, how you get information about what items you should show, like what its name is and stuff. The check by triggers is, is called when you select an item. The source, this is an important property, is for sale. And that was a list that we actually prepped. So the list up here is called for sale. And so that's how you link, um, you know, a particular um, list of items with a particular list you've generated. So you could create a planet where you had like competing markets. You know, you have like three mech bays and they all sell slightly different kinds of this one sells light mechs, this one heavy mechs, this one sells anything, you know, but it hurts your reputation if you buy from them, something like that. So you could um, have different prepped lists and then different markets would access different lists if you want to do something like that. So that's one idea. Um, and okay, I th think that's good. Um, so how do you launch battles? Um, I don't think there's any that directly, actually there is, yeah, because of training. Um, let's see here, new battle. Okay, so this is an old trigger that you actually can't access anymore. Um, there's like a two capital trigger, but it's in the blocked area. At one point when I was testing, you could walk to the gates and actually leave the city and you just end up in a battle. Um, so the trigger for going into a battle is new battle. And then it has the same sort of setup as before. You specify a map. So in this case, Pacifica Overworld. If you don't specify a JSON file, it will look for um, the... Uh, corresponding um, file. So let me go in here. Uh, we wanted campaigns, legacy, uh, maps, and is Pacifica Overworld it still exists, I think? Pacifica, no. I guess I've retired it. Unless I'm blind. Pacifica, I mean, there's Overworld South. So that's fine. Anyway, it would find the Pacifico Overworld map and the Pacifico Overworld JSON file. You could also add mods to this if you want. You could sort of stamp on some extra triggers and then this battle would launch instantly. So that's how you sort of immediately launch a battle. Um, on the other hand, if you want to launch... Um, oh, no, wait, actually, and that will bring up the unit, uh, like the unit setup screen. So where are we here, general... Uh, so like new battle yeah so here's another um you know when you go to the starport if you have a mission ready you'll actually get this prompt that says do you want to launch your mission and you can say yes and then what will happen is it will start a new battle and rather than specifying a map it will specify the accepted mission so the mission that you've accepted and will draw its map and json file info from that um, there's another little action here. This is a really subtle action in the RPG segments, but it's going to self-modify this JSON data, and it's going to add in uh, player spawn is the starport spawn. And that's just because when you enter the starport, right, um, you want this to be your spawn point when you come back to the RPG. If you look at what happens when you edit the arena, it modifies... The JSON data modifies itself to create arena spawn as the player spawn so that when you come back to the arena after having fought in the arena, you spawn here. You don't spawn somewhere over here, which wouldn't make sense. So self-mod is a little trigger you'll see throughout a lot of the RPG segments 
that often is moving the player spawn around. But you can do all sorts of other fun, fancy things with it. You can modify anything you want, really. It's uh, You could specify a file or just, in this case, some text uh, that's going to uh, modify the player spawn, which we saw oops, uh, up here. What was it? Player spawn. By default, player spawn is the player spawn um, area here, but then you want it to be the starport spawn if you've entered the starport, and this if you've entered the arena. And then there's like a comp star spawn and so on. Um, okay, I keep getting sidetracked with all sorts of things. So I think I was showing you the new battle. Um, okay. Um, let's take a look at the heist because a lot of people have asked, you know, when you play the game, um, you know, if you go and you find a pilot. So, hello, pilot. They have these weird skills, diplomacy, tech, medical negotiation. Long term, I want to do more with these, but you can do stuff with this already. And in fact, I feel like nobody has noticed this. So this is like literally a little Easter egg. Um, this is a gate to one of the city's mech yards. Look closer. You nonchalantly pause and take a closer look at the mech yard gate. It looks sturdy, yet you get the feeling it could be open with the right skills. All right, let's totally break in. Uh, you need to come back at night with a proper crew to do that. Oh, okay. I guess I don't have the skills. Well, here's something to consider. Okay, a few people have mentioned it. Um, okay. This person has a pickpocketing skill. What happens if we have them on our team when we try this event? Um, oops. So look closer, break in. Okay. They're they're still not skilled enough. Okay, hold on. Let's let's try and find somebody a little better. Pretty sure it's lock picking you need. Look for crew. Bah, he's a pickpocket. Okay, there's no one around. Let's just try this once or twice. Um, so let's just place a bet on somebody. Go nuts, and we'll just totally abandon this bet. Okay. Notice that we spawned right outside the arena. That's because we self-modded the player spawn. Just to kind of show you that in action. Um, let's see. Pickpocketing. Ugh. Why are these lockpicks crappy? <laughs> okay, let's try this one more time. I have an idea if this, this doesn't work, and it will sort of show another feature that I want to show to you guys today. Break in. Okay, the gate lock does look vulnerable. Aisha Lavone thinks she could pick it. So wait a sec. Aisha Lavone, she has level three lock picking, right? So you come in here. So the game actually detects that she is lock picking, and it gives you an option you didn't have before. So you go for it. Your crew stands uh, and watches. Aisha gets to work. This lock isn't too tricky, boss. Give me a few minutes and I'll have it, Aisha says. You start to get nervous, but just as you're about to call it off, uh, the gate lock clicks and your gate swings open. Wasting no time, your crew enters the mech yard. You cautiously enter. A few powered down mechs are sitting in storage. Um, blah, blah, blah. You reluctantly... Oh, um, the mechs are locked. There's no way to power them up without their command keys and no one in your crew seems to know enough about these mechs to do anything else. Reluctantly, you call it off. Hmm, it almost sounds like you need somebody with tech skills, right? And so if you did have somebody with tech skills, they could help you. I'm going to turn on debug mode right now, and I'm going to press a button to give me a little cheat. And by the way, look at all the cool mechs I now all of a sudden have. I'm going to show you guys how to use this cheat mode. I all of a sudden have a really capable crew and tons of people with tons of skills. Somebody should have some tech skills in here. So let's just try this one more time. Uh, so look closer, break in. Hey, look at this. Before, I just had an option to pick the lock. Now I have pick the lock or scale the wall. So let's try scaling the wall this time. Uh, looks like the gate could be scaled. Diana Finch thinks she could pull it off. Go for it. Diana takes a quick look around when no one is looking, jumps up the wall with surprising agility. Diana hops over the wall in just a moment. Crew waits around the gate, trying not to look suspicious. A few minutes go by, then 10, then you start to worry something's gone wrong. Just then, however, the gate clicks open from inside. Sorry, boss, Diana says. Took a minute to figure out the lock. Wasting no time, your crew enters the mech yard. You cautiously enter the mech yard. There are a few power down mechs. You're about to call things off when Ledger Verrill speaks up. Boss, I think I can hotwire this one over here. Should I try it? Go for it. 
Um, so long story short, he hot wires it. Yay, we get a locust for all our trouble. Okay, uh, whatever. We sneak it to the mech at lube, and now we have a locust. That is an example of how you can currently use skills, uh, uh, pilot skills in the game. And I'll show you all the triggers that just did that. But essentially, in a nutshell, what the game can do is when we walked into this event. Um, oh, it's gone now. It removes itself, by the way, once you've done it. But when you walk into it, it calls a trigger. And the trigger checks to see, um, you know, who in your crew has the highest lockpicking skill and what is that skill? Who in your crew has the highest acrobatic skill and what is that skill? Who in your, uh, your crew has the highest tech skill and what is that skill? And then based on those three results, it says, okay, if the lockpicking skill is above this level, then lockpicking is an option. If acrobatics are above this level, then jumping over the wall is an option. Um, and then it says, if you have at least one option that you can do, then give a prompt that allows you to basically do that and break in. If you don't, then have a prompt that says you have to come back later. Um, then it says, once you're in the mech yard, if you have enough tech skills, if one person on your crew has the, be the best tech skills or past the minimum that you need, then do a thing that lets you steal a locust, otherwise do a different prompt. So this was just basically a really basic choose your own adventure style uh, set of mission prompts. Um, but you can see they sort of string together and let you do a really basic heist. And again, long term, we're going to do more, or I want to do more maybe this summer with these skills. But for right now, this is sort of the extent of it. And you guys could start like today building campaigns that have this sort of um, interaction in the, the RPG parts, if you want. Somebody says, what happens if two characters have the same skill that would be high enough to do an action? Um, it essentially pulls the names randomly then. Um, I think it just does it by whichever crew was hired first because they kind of go in order into your crew list. Uh, so if you have two crew members with both with really good skills, it's just the first one that's found that passes your criteria that is used. So uh, let's look at, let's try and find this uh, heist. So... Um, so we can look at these things. I think I, no, I don't call it a heist. Uh, mech yard. There it is. Um, okay, so this is a gate to one of the city's mech yards. This is a prompt. If you select look closer, it, ca it calls mech yard look. Mech yard look. You nonchalantly look. If you call mech yard break in, here's where the action starts. This trigger has a bunch of actions it calls. First, it calculates a variable. Var is another trigger that you'll use a lot, especially in the RPG segments. This means do a variable statement. So you can do uh, equals to, plus equals, minus equals, times equals, divided equals. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is we're setting the mech yard trigger to be equal to, I have a little apostrophe here. That means treat this as a string. If I didn't have an apostrophe here, it would treat this as a variable and it would try and find a variable called mech yard break in can't, but I don't have a variable like that. But right now I'm creating a variable called mech yard trig and I can use this later on and you'll see mech yard trig will use it later on. Next, we have an if statement, find skill max, player crew lock picking. So we're gonna look in the player crew and try and find somebody uh, or try and find the maximum skill that we've got. And if that is greater than or equal to three, then the mech yard trigger becomes mech yard break in lock only. Okay, next we say find skill max player acrobatics. Um, if that's greater than three, then the mech yard trigger actually changes to mech yard break in acro only. Um, and then we do one more check. And this checks if both of these are true. Then we actually set the mech yard trigger to mech yard break in lock or acro. So basically, either lock pick or acrobat. This is a little sort of redundant, this if statement. You could clean it up a bit. Um, like you could do this check first or something like that. But anyway, um, it works. So we'll leave it as is. I'm not going to modify anything today. Um, but if both, uh, if your max skills for both of these are above a certain level, then you can, uh, you'll get a different prompt. So this prompt is. Which one do you want to do? And notice that we created a variable called mechyard trig, right? And this is the name of a trigger that we want to call. Um, we then call a trigger, and the trigger we call is the variable mechyard trig. 
if we just had mechyard trig, it would look for a, a trigger called mechyard trig. But by putting the squirrely brackets around it, we're saying, get me the value out of this variable. And the value is something like this. So then it will call this trigger. So we used a string variable in order to figure out which uh, trigger to call next. And then from here, you know, we have a series of other triggers and we do some other checks. Um, and uh, when you do find a skill, so if, when you call this uh, little function called find skill max, it will actually create a variable called skilled crew and it will populate it with that crew member that you found. And so that's how we were able to use the actual crew members names in the descriptions. You know, Diana jumps over the wall. Um, so you can actually, you'll have new variables that get created when you call this and you found a crew member that you can use for things. Um, so you can have skilled crew first name, you can have skilled crew name, which is just their entire name, uh, and so on. And then your whole little event goes on. And if you get a locust, then in the get mech trigger, um, you have uh, add player unit locust. That's literally all there is to it. And it will just add a, a fresh new locust to your uh, list for you. So, yeah. Um, another um, another campaign that we have that does use a lot of triggers like this is the Mech Warrior campaign. And one of the reasons I wanted to make this ahead of the live stream, both because I think it's kind of cool that we remade the Mech Warrior campaign, and um, to be able to show it to you guys, is that um, this campaign it similarly has sort of choose your own adventure kind of options. This one uses variables in a slightly different way. So I was trying to kind of mix it up and show you there's different ways of doing things and then get the same result. Um, the start story trigger is a trigger that starts at the beginning of the game. I've shown you how you get that to happen. But here's a list of actions. One of them, it sets up a variable called story step, which is equal to 10. So now we have a variable, an internal variable in the game's memory called story step, and we can refer to it. We can also, in the Mech Warrior campaign, you know, you need to find Grig at one point, and he's on a planet. Well, we can have a random variable, and the variable will be, will be called Grig Planet, and we can select from this list. And that's how the game makes sure Grig isn't always on the same planet. So now there is a planet called Grig variable. It's a string variable, and it values one of these things. You know, there's a Smithson planet. There's um, a Jack planet, a Black Widow planet. So you can have not only just variables, but also random variables. And then you can have a Darkwing planet. You can have other variables that are like Boolean value, like talked to tech is true or false, sniper story added, true or false. So these are all like little flags and variables that will get checked at different points uh, along the way of the, the story. And so you can see, you know, if we scroll down um, in here, um, let's see. Do we have them? We have them. Yeah. So here's, you know, if you try and go into the Mech Warrior bar and try and get a drink, um, if your current planet is the Black Widow planet and the story step is exactly 130, then do all these specific actions and like give people a choice, you know, like of some scenario that's playing out. Uh, and then depending on what you do here, you might die. And if you live, then story step will be increased to 140. Then when you come back into the bar, this trigger won't fire. So you can sort of create all sorts of like different little triggers and stuff that are looking for certain conditions. Uh, there's something else we scrolled past up here I just wanted to mention. Um, there's other, so you can call a trigger. You can also call delay triggers, which are triggers that will fire after this much game time has gone on. So 0.5 seconds. Triggers can be the name of triggers that are actually in your current JSON file. They can also be files. Um, so in this case, file colon says that don't look for a trigger that's currently here. Instead, open up this file and whatever trigger is in there, that's what you should, uh, that's what you should use. So for instance, um, this would be in scripts, mech warrior story choice. So mech warrior story choice. So here is just, you know, prompt, size, some text and options and stuff. Um, that file gets opened and that is actually used as the trigger every time. The one handy thing I will say to you guys, um, 
<laughs> can you get inebriated at the Mech Warrior bar? Um, no, you can order as many drinks as you want. Your guy always stays sober, but somebody else, somebody could do a drunk mod if they want. That'd be fun. Um, the one thing that's handy about specifying rather than like a trigger specifying a file, because if you look in here, um, you know, we we're using it, uh, at different points here, um, somewhere. Yeah, so for instance, when you go to adjust the sound volume, rather than having an actual trigger in the in the game JSON file, it's calling a file, which is the sound volume file. One handy thing about calling a file is that every time the JSON, every time this trigger gets called, it will open that file, and whatever is in it, it will get loaded in fresh every time. So if you are developing the game, and you say, let's say you're trying to figure out how you want the bar to look, um, and so you're trying to figure out, you know, how wide should it be? So you're playing around with its size and you're playing around with its text and things. If this trigger exists in your JSON stuff, it won't update if you update stuff in the file because the JSON file gets loaded into memory and all that JSON file stuff is there. And every time the trigger gets called, it's just the one in memory that gets used. But if instead you're referring to a file, then every time it tries to call this trigger, it has to open the file and reload it, it will constantly update the file. And so I'll show you what I mean for that in just a moment, but that's how you can, um, an easy way that you can have um, scripts that will, every time you go to look at something, it will be updated. And so you can be editing the file as you play the game and you'll see the updates live almost. Um, but a delay trigger uh, fires on a delay. You can also do uh, a queue trigger and a queue trigger then you just need the name. You don't need to add a delay parameter or anything. And a queue trigger is just wait for your turn and wait until there's no other triggers that are currently running and then activate. Um, normally, if you call a trigger, it happens right away. So, you know, uh, I'll try and find a trigger. These are all delay triggers. Um, let me find one in here. Trigger. Huh, that's weird. I know they exist in the game. I made the dang thing. Um, oh, it's because, yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, like, let's say you're... Nah, nah, it doesn't make sense there. Sorry. Okay, let's say you have a list of things going on here. And then at the end, when it gets to this part where it just says call trigger, it will immediately call the trigger and immediately do this thing. If you know that, um, you know, you've done all this work, you know that you want this mech yard to appear, but you want to do a few other things first, you could make this a queued trigger. And then what will happen is this trigger now goes into a queued list. And then once the game basically isn't running any current actions and it's not doing anything it will check that queued list and see if there's any triggers that it needs to uh it needs to run and then it will run so queue trigger and delay trigger are two other options you have for um modifying these things okay just really quickly um i want to show you something so let's say mech markets uh, mech markets okay so when you enter the mech market, at the very top, it says mechs for sale, right? So if we go over here and we come into the mech market, what mechs do you have for sale? It says mechs for sale, right? And maybe you say, yeah, I don't want to say mechs for sale. I want it to say awesome mechs for sale. You know, you're, mod you're making your own campaign. So I, I'm saving this. I say, okay, now what happens when I enter the mech market? So I leave, I come back in, and, oh, it didn't pick up my change. What happened? The reason your change is not being detected is because this uh, RPG JSON exists in the system's memory, and it's not reloading the file every time something happens. It would just be loading the file constantly then. So um, if I want to see this awesome mechs for sale, what I have to do is I have to quit, start a new campaign, come back into any campaign that uses the general mech market trigger, come over here, and then now it says awesome mechs for sale. Okay. Um, if rather than having the mech market, you know, in here in all its gloriousness, 
I instead said, actually, for this, I want you to use uh, a mech market script. And then in that script, I'm going to put everything that I want to appear. Okay. So I'll do this. And I'll do this. There we go. Okay, so resources, scripts, and I think I called it mech market. Okay, so now what happens is I have to start a new campaign for this stuff to even go into memory. But let's, oh, and I should call it mechmarket.json. So it's actually the right file. Uh, but now let's see what happens when I start a new campaign. Um, oh, did I, I think I left an error in my stuff here. Did I? I think the game just crashed. It's okay. Probably just a type on the JSON. Uh, yes. It is. Mech market. There's a missing comma somewhere. Wait, what? Two nine. <sighs> um, expecting colon. What did I not do right? Um, hold on. Bear with me while I figure this out. On line 1864, 1864. Oh, <laughs> uh, duh. There we go. Yeah, I was, yeah. Syntax was wrong. So, guys, it's okay. I only made this. I only made the whole thing. <laughs> it's not like uh, I should expect be expected to know how this thing works or anything like that. Okay, I'm bringing the game back up. Where did it go? Okay. Start a new campaign now. And, all right. So we come in. Next for sale. Oops. Um, it did not like that. Because... Scripts, mech market. Scripts, mech market. Let me just see what I did here. This is a danger trying to do this all live. Mechmarket.json. Okay, why do you not like that? Scripts. Market.json. Um, what am I not seeing? Am I like sleep deprived? What is happening here? Well, maybe I just didn't save it. Let's try this again. Nope. What am I not seeing? Okay, you know what? It doesn't matter. I, I don't want to do this live. I'm just going to undo my changes here. And we'll do this with the paint bay. Um, so people are mentioning you left colon. Oh, I left colon. Yeah, okay. There's a typo. It's okay. Um, I'm more paranoid about making a change that I forget to revert. So we're going to undo that. But uh, you guys caught it. It was a typo. Let's let's do this with the paint bay instead. Okay, the paint bay actually loads from a file. So if you... Uh, let's reboot this campaign. So it's in there correctly. Let me just make sure the mech bay is in there properly. Too many colons. Yep. That was it. Okay, so let's say, you know, uh, my mechs need a new paint job. So you guys are going to be great editors because you're catching typos even I can't see. So... You're ahead of the game. You guys are on this. Um, paint Bay is scripts, frames, paint bay. So if we come in here, scripts, frames, uh, paint bay. Um, the title is the mech and spray. So if we come in here, um, I want to paint my mechs, mech and spray. Um, if we say, well, let's, let's rename that, you know, mech and spray, a couple of exclamation points. Come in here, speed shop, 
paint job. You see the exclamation points. So if you are loading, there we go. If you're loading JSON files from files, um, if you have triggers that are calling files, it will update automatically and you can like go in and out of buildings and see them constantly change. So it's a really fast way of testing things. If you do not, there is one little uh, secret you can use in order to nonetheless um, edit things. So there's a debug JSON file. And this debug JSON file has a lot of commented out actions, and I can tell you about these in a second. But remember that self mod that I was telling you about? We were modding the player starting points. Well, you can also self mod and pass along an entire file to load in. So action args, and we're loading in a file, scripts, frames, general. Why would you ever want to reload the general? Uh, JSON data and overlay it on top of the general JSON data you've already got? Well, maybe it's because you've edited the general JSON data. So I'll tell you how to run this debug script in a minute, but suffice to say that I can run it. And so you can run it during the game. So if we go to mech market again, and we say mechs for sale. Okay, so if we go in to our mech market, mechs for sale. Then I say, okay, well, now I want it to say awesome. Mech's for sale, awesome. I am terrible at grammar, so I want my mech bay to be poorly phrased. Um, still doesn't say it, but I'm going to activate debug mode, and I'm going to press a button here that's going to run this debug script. And so what this script is going to do is load in the current uh, general RPG JSON data and overlay it into memory. It's going to overlay it into the existing. That's what the self-mod does. So when I press that button, now when I come in here, Mechs for sale, awesome. Cool. Okay, that grammar is terrible. Let's just take that off and undo it. So come back in here, take it off, save the file, come back to the game, press my debug key again. In fact, I don't even have to leave this menu, right? Mechs for sale, awesome. I just press the debug key, mechs for sale. It just automatically changed. So the debug uh, JSON script is a script you can really manipulate to quickly test and, and, and uh, you know, check things out. Um, so let me tell you a little more about the debug stuff. We're, we're nearing the end of the general stuff I wanted to cover today, and I'll try and think if there's anything else I need to tell you. You can obviously ask questions. But okay, this debug mode, how am I turning this on and off? Um, let me bring back my timeshare slides, and let's see. Okay. So the debug mode is turned on by holding control and pressing the tilde key. Um, and this is where you'll get the debug uh, true or false message. It pops up to let you know you're in debug mode. There's a bunch of cool keys you can press in debug mode. Debug mode is not meant for cheating. So for instance, the X key, it adds cheat units, which are helpful if you're trying to test combat and stuff. You don't have to go accumulate units. You can just automatically add a bunch of units to your list. That's how I was able to get a bunch of pilots. It also ensures you always get 120 salvage picks. So you can basically pick whatever you want. Everything almost gets offered to you. But do not press X during combat. It will lag the game and you'll have to quit combat and go back in. It doesn't like ruin the game, but it's just, it's manually adding a bunch of game, uh, units to the player list. And during combat, combat was not designed to have units added like that. So it like really screws it up. Um, so again, debug mode is not meant as a cheat mode. So it's, you know, it's got a few quirks to it, but it's a developer thing. So if you're using it, think of yourself as a developer, not a cheater. Well, maybe you're doing both. I don't know. Um, and know that it's like not totally user friendly. It just, it is how it is. So Z, uh, Z or the Z button shows you all your triggers on your map. We'll look at that in a sec. X adds a bunch of units. F1 calls the mission success trigger. So if you're in a battle mission, just press F1 and you can automatically go to the salvage screen, go to the next mission. It's very fast for if you just want to like plow through some missions and see what happens when they end. If you're testing something, V kills every non-player unit on the battlefield. They all just explode at once. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, M sets your money to 100 million C bills. Y increments the year. U increments the month. I increments the day. Um, are these keybinds to find the JSON somewhere? They are not. These are just hard coded in at the moment. Um, I might make the debug mode more user friendly down the line, but these are just hard coded at the moment. And 
R calls the script slash debug JSON file. And it calls it as a file, so you can um, go into the, um, the debug thing and you can edit it whenever you want. So for instance, right now when I press R, um, it self-mods and brings in the general stuff. What if every time I press R, I want to go inside the bar? I want to call the trigger bar inside. Well, now I've just saved this. And if I come back to the game and I press R, now I'm in the bar. So you can set up um, whatever custom actions, whatever custom triggers you want. So it's really helpful for um, testing all this stuff out. Um, there we go. Uh, there are a few other things in here. So bar inside. Um, you know, here's another one I was using at one point when I was testing the mod base select unit screen. So you just come here and press R and it doesn't want to pull up. Maybe there's another typo or something. Anyway, it's not that important. Oh, it's because, yeah, oops. You need an action. This is the argument. So we're called, so the action is trigger and the args is this. Um, so if we come back to the game, there we go. So now you bring up the mod bay just by pressing R. Um, yeah. And let's see what else. Let's get rid of this and this and this. Um, I think this one just relaunches the startup. It relaunches the career. Uh, I won't do it right. Well, whatever. I'll do it. <laughs> Um, no, I crashed for some reason. Um, yeah, that's fine. That was an old debug trigger I was using. And, oh, one other thing you can do is you can do loops in this. Uh, uh, actions can be loops. So action loop um, then takes in an arguments parameter. And in that, you define a variable like i. So this is an internal game variable called i that will be updated every iteration of the loop. You define the number of iterations you want and then the actions that should be performed every iteration of the loop. And so, for instance, you can uh, print, will print text to the console area. So if you are like developing your own campaign or something, you might want to know like, what is Griggs Planet? Where are the Black Widows? You can use an action called print and you could say print, you know, Griggs Planet is equal to... Uh, the variable grig planet, uh, you know, and then that will like show that in the console. So when you're testing, you can like see, you can also print the variable I, so you can, you know, print every, this is like a four I is less than 30 loop. So we'll go through and what, what this is actually doing is updating the goods prices. This is basically updating the stock market. I was using this loop to test one month of stock updates at a time when I was uh, testing it. So there you go. There's another thing you can do. I'm going to revert a bunch of these back, though. Okay. And let me just rerun the game because it crashed because my debug script. There you go. One thing you can't do is have a bunch of, in JSON, you can't have, like, duplicate... Uh, there we go, thanks. You can't have duplicate uh, variable names. So you, if you just have X action, X args, X args, X, X action, X args, it'll crash because you can't have more than one uh, thing with the same name. So that's why I have X, 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 X. So I'm just sort of like marking a capital X over here. Uh, it's sloppy in the debug file, the debug JSON file right now. But uh, yeah. What is the, the scope of a variable and its lifetime? Variables you create are global and they exist forever. They exist until you quit that game. Um, when you get back to the main menu or you start a new campaign, they're gone. Uh, variables you create get saved and they get loaded. So you can create a variable uh, on the very first RPG map you load up in a campaign. It'll exist as long as that as the player's playing that campaign. Um... So let's see, we're uh, we're planning on going over the news net. I get the basic idea. Yeah, I can take a look at the news net. That's not a problem. Um, before I get to that, um, oh, the debug. Yeah, let me show you just a few more things with the debug because I showed you all those buttons. So if I press Y, pay attention to the year. Um, oh, I have to turn it into debug mode. 
Once you turn into debug mode, it stays in that mode. Even if you start new campaigns, it only turns off if you quit the game or if you press control tilt again. But debug mode is on. Watch what happens to the year when I press Y. It increments. So when we get to uh, 3030, um, oh, actually, I guess, uh, yeah, I turned the news blurbs off in the Crescent Hawks campaign. But if we start an actual career, Okay, so watch what happens. We get to 3030. Now we get a flash, a news flash. In January 3030, fourth succession war. We can keep incrementing the year up to 39, and then we get another news flash. So you can play around. You can you can test if you, you know, want certain star maps to appear on certain years. So there's a 3039 map. Maybe I say, okay, in 3049 it's supposed to change. So when I get to 3049, it does. Oh no, wait. 3050 is supposed to change. It does. Yeah. So if you're making custom star maps, you can use a debug mode to fast forward the dates and stuff. If you do go into the um, options menu, there's also a debug menu here. And you can actually rewind dates. You can set the year to 3025. Um, and then you can fast forward once again. So, you know, like you can play around with the dates pretty easily. Um what were the other buttons that we have here? Um, where's my, okay, money is simple. You press M and now you're a millionaire. Um, and it doesn't add a hundred million, it sets it to a hundred million. So like if you come in, you know, and you buy a whole bunch of mechs and you leave and you press M again, it's back to a hundred million. If I press M right now, it doesn't do anything because I have a hundred million. So that's uh, that's how that works. You could also, by the way, if you wanted, you know, you could come into the, the debug thing and say, you know, okay, well, uh, when somebody presses the debug button, do a variable action. And the variable action is money is equal to one, zero, zero, one, two, three, one, two, three. So, um, you know, this would have the debug button set your money to 100 million. It's not needed because M will do it, but just to show you, you can use variable statements and you can do equals and plus equals and minus equals and, you know, anything you want. It's um, pretty, uh, it, it, if you've done any programming, it, it covers the basics um, at least. Um, and let's see, so year and dates and all that, you can mess with the month and the, the day as well if you want. So you can just watch time fly by. So that's fun. Um, and so that's incrementing the stuff. Oh yeah, um, X. So if we go into um, here, let's main menu. Okay, so debug mode was still on. So if I come in, I have a chameleon and one crew. If I press the uh, X button, now if I come back into my status, all of a sudden I have a ton of mechs. I have a ton of mechs. Um, and yeah, it doesn't want to show the debug units. Um, and you have a bunch of crew. They'll be legendary or elites typically. Uh, in fact, exclusively, you won't have any veterans. Um, and then you get a bunch of tech. So X is like a button. It's like, make me flush. Give me a bunch of stuff. Because if you're testing, sometimes you just want a bunch of mechs. Um, and if we take a mission real quick, um, like whatever, who cares? Uh, it also not only makes you flush, it automatically assigns a bunch of units to your battle setup. And you're going to have these special units called debug units that are automatically set up. These are atlases with negative one tons. So you can, it will give you four every time you press X. Um, so, uh, they appear, um, in fact, they don't even appear in the list because they don't weigh anything. So I guess you can only take four into battle. You only need four. They have eight gauze rifles with near infinite ammo and three PPCs, and they move at speed 14 with jump jets at speed 14. So if you want, you know, like, let's say you're testing this baby out and you say, I just want to run into a mission, clean house in 10 seconds. Cause I just, I don't want to do this over and over. So wait, what is our mission? You'll be engaging in a raid. Okay, perfect. So here are my uh, debug commandos going in to help me test, and they're just going to tear things apart. So yeah, those units didn't stand a chance. You know, wipe this out. And okay, then they can exit the mission. 
And if I want, I can press F1 at this point. Here, let's watch them kill some things because it's hilarious. So the power of God's rifles. <laughs> if God's rifles didn't weigh as much as they did and had infinite ammo, they'd be completely OP. Anyway, I'll press F1. It just ends the mission right away. Um, yeah, the Scout Atlas. This is the Steiner uh, Recon Atlas. Uh, their experimental recon atlases, finally. Um, but anyway, because we're in debug mode, I have 120 salvage selections. So you can see basically anything I want, I can take. So you can try and just, you know, it, it's very helpful for when you're uh, testing these things uh, to be able to, like, do this stuff really fast. Um, so a lot of the debug keys functionality, people, somebody asked if there's a JSON file for it. Um, it just sort of emerged with time as features I needed to happen because I needed to test this faster. And so it's sort of hacked in there. Um, but again, I might clean it up a little down the line. But for now, this is how it works. The last thing you might want is the Z key. If you press this, you get a sort of wireframe view of all the blocked tiles you can see. So the red tiles are the ones the game is currently checking for collisions with my player. You can see, uh, you know, building triggers are shown in red. So that was the mech trigger, the mech bay trigger. So this is helpful if you're trying to see like where triggers actually end up. It should, they should appear correctly um, based on your tiled map. But if not, you can always come in here. It lags the game a little bit to show all these triggers. So you don't want to play the game like this necessarily, uh, but it can be handy. And when you go into battle, this is really handy. If Z mode is on, then if you come into battle here, so it loads, not only can you see the blocks in battle as well, so all the blockages are shown in yellow, but as long as Z mode is on, enemies are visible and controllable. So this is really handy when you're testing. So here are enemies. Obviously, I shouldn't be able to see them, but I can. Not only can I see where they're moving, I can see the exact path they plan to take. And if I select a unit, I can give it orders. Um, so you can control enemies the same way you control your units when you're in debug mode. And we can unpause it, and they obey my orders. So come here, my little bandit minions. You belong to me now. You're mine. Um, but yeah, this this will make it really easy when you're testing maps, testing conditions. Like if you if you spawned an evac zone and you want to know if enemies go in this zone, will they disappear? You can literally manually force them to go and give them commands. Um, if enemies do have certain AI modes, like they're in hunt mode or something, and you give them a place to go, they might all of a sudden, after a second or two, revert back to hunt and start going elsewhere. So you might have, have to sort of click repeatedly to keep them going where you need them to go, but they will eventually listen. Um, but again, just sort of because the debug mode is hacked in a little, um, that's how it works. Um, okay. I think that's all that we need from debug mode. Oh, let's watch. Okay. The V button's fun. All right. You guys want victory V for victory. <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, and then, yeah, they're destroyed instantly. So yeah, the V button is a handy way to destroy the enemies. Uh, if you press F1 and you haven't killed any enemies, so you go right to mission success, you will not see any enemies in the salvage because you didn't kill any. The salvage works in this game by looking at the list of destroyed enemies and drawing units from that. It won't just call units that fled or aren't destroyed. So if you're testing a map and you keep pressing F1, you see no salvageable units because you're not killing anything. So get out there, kill some guys, or press V to have everyone self-destruct. Um, okay, so I know there was a question about the news net. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any other questions. Scope and lifetime of variables. I think we got all that. Um, uh, what are you running the game on? You say things like get lag with high end hardware and barely noticing. Oh, so uh the game is written in Pygame. Yeah, well, Python, and it uses the Pygame library and a couple other libraries, like the pathfinding uh code is actually a C library. Um because Python is way too slow for that. But um, I'm running the game in debug mode, so I don't have a console window right now. If you guys want to see what my console window is, it is this. Like, here's my console window. Like, this is all the stuff you would see. And when I'm running it in debug mode, it runs slower and laggier for me because if you know anything about coding, when you uh, are running things in debug mode, at any point, I can actually pause the execution of the game 
and then I can come in and I can manually inspect the current values of gain, uh, of any variables like on the fly. And you can do all sorts of other like really handy breaks and checks. Um, when I run the mo the, the game after it's been compiled or like after it's, you know, if I run it without debugging, it runs a lot better. But um, I guess I noticed the points where the game engine is going to struggle the most because for me, it is running in its worst possible mode. It's entirely likely that when you're running it, even in the parts where I notice a bit of lag, you won't see any lag because it's always going to run better for you guys than for me because you're not running it in developer mode, um, which I'm often doing. So that's just what I meant by uh, laggy. If you have good hardware, chances are this game will be close to 60 frames a second almost all the time and you'll never notice a problem. Um, okay, let's take a quick look at news nets and then we'll see if there's any other questions. And then fingers crossed I didn't irre irrevocably, blah, irrevocably mod some file here that uh, we have to go in and fix later. I don't think I did. Um, but um, okay. Um, so first of all, if you go into the texts folder in um, the resources, um, you'll find some text. By the way, if you want, so for arena matches, the title matches are all here. Um, and S, so, you know, now that you know sort of how to call variables, you can recognize Hill 17 reenactment, squiggly bracket year, and that's saying get the value of the current game year. The percentage S int is saying force that number into a string integer, meaning no commas. If you didn't have this, if you just had this, then the year 3025 would be shown as 3 comma 025. Like it would treat the number that it gets as, you know, like a, a dollar amount. Because um, when, you, when you're reporting C-bills, you know, a million C-bills, you want 1 comma 000 comma 000. You don't just want 1 and 6 zeros. It's illegible. But if you use the percent uh, S int uh, add-on, and these spaces have to be here, um, the spaces, if you look in my scripts, are usually very, uh, you know, um, intentional. So if you're, you're ever doing an if statement, if you do something like, you know, you're starting to write your little JSON and you say, if variable one is equal to var two, then, you know, do this action, blah, blah, blah. This statement will fail because if you go and look at every single if statement I ever write, I actually have spaces here. And so those spaces need to be there so that the game can parse that this is an operator um, properly. So for the uh, equals, not equals, greater than, less than, you have to have spaces around the operator. If you're just doing like, you know, that, var1 plus var3 is equal to var2. Um, the pluses, I think, are tolerant of whether there's a space or not a space. But generally, I like to have no spaces just uh, in case. So, you know, again, this engine was kind of hacked together with me over time so it has a few idiosyncrasies and that's actually one so if your if statements aren't working check to make sure that you have spaces the other thing that i've done accidentally is if i know i want to check a couple conditions um var 9 is less than var 10 you know i might have a list like that and i forget to add the and at the beginning then if you don't have an and or an or because you can do or as well right if you don't have an and or an or, then what happens is this entire if statement just fails because it doesn't have an operator. It doesn't know how to deal with these two statements. So remember, because I've made this mistake myself, have an and or an or at the beginning of any if statement where there's multiple conditions. Um, I think it takes and or, it will take not as well. Let me just check real quick while we're all here. Um, so we want and... Yeah, and, or, or not. And I think if it takes a not, um, if it takes a not, then you can only pass one statement to it. And you can't nest these lists. So if I did like, you know, not variable one plus variable two equals variable three, that's how you'd have to write the not statement. But then I couldn't say, okay, and I'm going to have an and statement in here and blah, blah, blah. Um, it currently doesn't allow sort of nested uh, layers. Um, although actually maybe it would. Actually, I'm looking at the... I'm looking at the source code right now. It might be tolerant of that. You know what? 
<laughs> you guys can discover something new. I don't think anywhere in my game code do I actually use nested statements. Uh, but who knows? For a nine is less than 11. Who knows? So maybe you could have an if statement like that and it would actually work for you. Uh, but if it doesn't, then it's failing because of the nestedness of what you're trying to do. Okay, anyway, so these text files, you can go in and edit them. So you can edit the match title names. These names just get pulled randomly for any arena match. And then um, the descriptions are in here. And, you know, you can just go in and you can see, you know, now maybe you can understand a little, you know, it's prepped an arena map for battle. And for the uh, currently selected mission from the list that you're looking at, um, look at the force zero, you know, force zero and force one are the first two forces that are in the game and grab its name. So, you know, you know, like uh, Haley's Bandicats and like the Red Scourge. So these are variables in the text file that will uh, try and call from the game's variable um, memory uh, and figure out what names to actually display here. So that's how we display uh, arena matches in um, uh, in these text files here. And there's like one or two. Let me just see if I can find it real quick. Um, let's see. These are force names. Force names again. Okay, so here's one where... Okay, so force zero seems to be heavily favored to win this upcoming match, but a last-minute substitute of selected missions force one, so the next force uh, name, so force one's name, with a new... And then it goes into unit lists, and it goes into the unit list for force number one, and it grabs the first unit out of that list. So that's what this whole thing is saying. It will actually grab a mech name list. So we'll say something like, you know, at first glance, Force Zero looks like they're going to win against Force One, but Force One last minute substituted in a new Hermes, and that has changed the math. So you can actually pull other variables um, from the selected prep missions. And if people are interested in getting fancy with this, I can like tell you all the variables that exist. Uh, spoilers, there's not that many you can mess with, but just so you can kind of read and understand what these files are doing. Okay, the Newsnet also exists um, in in the text uh, file. There's like a little news file. Mech Warrior news stories are the only news stories currently in uh, the game. Uh, again, like the available and the prevalent mechs, you can just drop other text files in here and the game will read them all when it's reading in news stories. What the game does for reading in news stories is it opens the text file and it looks for uh, sort of two uh, greater than signs back to back. These two little chevrons indicate that a date is about to be provided and then everything following is part of that news story until the next pair of chevrons is detected. So the way the game will read this is it will say, okay, on June 23rd, 3024, this news story uh, can become active. Now, in terms of the dates, it's pretty tolerant of how you want to write this. So you could do June 23rd like this. Um, you know, you can do, um, you know, uh, so January, February, March, April, May, June. So you could do 06, 24, right? Like you can, you can present the dates in different ways and it will read it. Uh, I'm just going to say no to those changes. Actually, I'll load this in here. Um, but, you know, day, month, year is fine. And you can use either long form or short form uh, dates. So you can use like August. And it doesn't have to be capitalized. So it's pretty tolerant with reading in what the date is and parsing that out. Then it will just literally read in this text and save it. And it will trim off any white space. So you can have spaces between your articles if you want. Um, and so it loads in all these and you'll see these are just a bunch of news stories that were in MechWarrior 1 because I had that text handy. Um, if you have a news story with an invalid date, so question mark, question mark, question mark is invalid, it won't bother loading it. It will just skip it. So you can sort of, that's the equivalent of commenting this story out of the news net. Um, and then you can even comment out large sections of your text file if you want. So none of these are in the uh, news net. And then here's a bunch. They don't have to be in chronological order. The game will sort that out. It will load in these news stories, figure out the date. And then what will happen is um, just as you're playing, if you go to Comstar and um, check the news net, um, it will check your current date and it will show you the first story that you haven't seen yet. Um, and so it should be the case... 
So every time I'm going to the news net, it's showing me the next story I haven't seen. But if I go back, you can see some of the other ones. Um, but eventually, you know, if you if you read forward, you'll get to where there are no more news stories. And then when you check the news net, it will start you there and you can go previous. So the news net kind of pays attention to what has been read so it doesn't show you something you've read before. You can always go previous and see previous stories. Um, it will try and start you off on the most recent story you haven't seen. You can press next, and then as you see them, the, these stories get marked as read. Um, and then you just click done to exit. And it is possible to insert... Um, uh, How is it filtering that list simply by date? Yes, it's looking at the game's date, and it's using that. Um, and what it does actually is it converts all the dates into numbers. So it's like, you know, one, 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 you know, January 1st, year one is one. And then it just counts up. So the year 3025, it's some huge number. It's like a couple billion or million or something. And it checks to see if a new story story's date number is uh, less than the current dates number. And if so, then it makes it available to read. And if it's already read, it marks it as read. Um, there is a way to manually add uh, stories to the newsnet. So this happens, uh, let's see, news. Um, this happens in the Mech Warrior thing. Um, let's see. See, now, part of the reason I developed all these different campaigns and stuff is for references for myself. Because truthfully, sometimes I forget how a list works and I have to go and like, okay, where's that mech market? And you find a mech market where it works and you look at everything it's doing. And sometimes I even just copy it and paste it to a new trigger I'm trying to develop and then start modifying it from there. So uh, yeah, even I forget how all this stuff works sometimes, as you can imagine. But um Okay, here we go. News net index. That's weird. I wasn't finding it before. Um, yeah, so the news net, it, it, when you, if you look at the triggers that are bringing up the news net, it does some checking and some calculations to figure out which news net story to show. But here's a case where if story step is greater than 110, meaning you've gotten to a certain point in the Mech Warrior campaign and the sniper story hasn't been added yet, then the sniper story added flag gets set to true. And then it adds to the list, to the news list, a news item, and it, it pulls it from this text file. And it dates it today, and it saves, um, it, you have a save index thing. I forget exactly what that does. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Copy this and modify it. This is a case where if something has happened, or if a certain game event has occurred, we can actually add to the news net a particular story and we can provide the date that should occur on that story. So in this case, we're dating it today. You could give it different dates if you want. Um, and that would essentially um, force the story into the news at a certain time. So this story will only appear at a certain point in the campaign. It won't just appear as time marches on. So that's kind of a cool thing you could do. Um, and so that's in the Mech Warrior General. Use that as a reference um, for if you want to add these stories. Um, cool. I'm just going to bring up our slides one more time. Just see if there's anything else I can think to tell you guys. Oh, we'll take a very brief look at the Crescent Hawks revenge campaign. Cause that one actually, um, those bastards at Infocom and Westwood made some of the most complex first missions ever. So I was long time trying to convert the Crescent Hawks revenge campaign into a campaign like Mech Warrior 1 so that you could play it in Battle Mercs. I thought it would be so cool. I still want to do it one day, but the first like four missions have such complex unit triggers. It's crazy. Um, oh, we never covered editing units, so we will take a look at that. Um, okay, and then we'll we'll end on that. Oh, and we'll mention graphics. Okay, a couple, a couple more things, but none of them are as involved as what we just did. Um, very quickly... Um, can you have complex win conditions for a battle? Yes, you certainly can. Um, and so, uh, let me bring that up before we move to the Crescent Hawks thing. So I think, um, uh, what are, oh wait, we want scripts. 
trying to think like what are some of the most complex current contracts but i mean you can get even more complex than this but um let's look at where's the diversions okay here's a diversion map so this is where you have to engage enemies and there's a convoy that will move unguarded, but it will only start moving once you've engaged the enemy. Um, so the way this works is um, during an event. So the unit damaged event uh, causes a check to occur where it checks to see if the triggering unit is a faction uh, or is the convoy faction. And if so, it calls the convoy under attack message box. Um, otherwise, um, if, uh, the triggering unit, uh, is either the enemy or the players, and it means the enemy and the players have engaged, then it calls diversion started. Diversion started is a trigger that issues an order to the convoy to tell them to move to the evac zone. The evac zone then will start tracking when the convoy arrives. And so here's a convoy evac trigger. When the convoy gets there, um, when there's no more convoy, it may trigger, then it triggers, uh, you know, a, a condition where now the players have to try and reach the, the evac zone. And so if a player has reached the evac zone and the can escape, uh, variable Boolean is flagged, yes. And the triggering unit is a player, then the, tr the player escapes. And so you can kind of create these complex web of conditions where like, okay, so it's like the convoy has to have all escaped first. Then you turn on the player can escape variable. Then you tell the player they have to escape. Then the player units have to get there. And so, you know, that's an example of one of the most complex things we're doing right now. You could get so much more complicated. You could say after the convoy escapes and enemy reinforcements come, but then maybe NPC reinforcements come and then they all try and engage in the map. And the player has to defeat at least 50% of the enemies and then they get a message that they can escape. Um, but, you know, defenders spawn to try and stop them. So it's like only one player unit has to escape or only the main, unit, you know. And so it's like you can create these really complex scenarios with all these triggers. Um, it's just a matter of stacking events and triggers one on top of the other. But, um, you know, I would be really excited to see how fancy somebody could get. But it will take a lot of, like, if-then logic. But at its core, it's just a bunch of, like, flags and checks. Um, but it sort of emerges in this sort of fun gameplay when you get it working right. Um, okay, the Crescent Hawks Revenge. Um, let's see here um chr yeah i'm not going to cover all of this today because this would just take forever but just to show you a few interesting things you can do um so on the very first mission of the crescent hawks revenge even though you selected your units and crew and stuff you actually don't get to use them instead you have a fixed crew and a fixed list of units so this is a case where on the first mission we're spawning uh you know mission one player spawn is the spawn point um, this is the player unit's faction, but rather than using any of the player's units, we actually used a, f a new fixed unit called Grease Anderson. Um, and rather than using the player mechs, we actually have a, a custom list that just has a Jenner. Um, and then we have, you know, an enemy locust spawn. Um, there's some events, some triggers in here, like destroying the enemy triggers a success, obviously. If uh, a unit is damaged, if the enemy isn't already retreating, and the damaged enemy, uh, the damaged unit is a Curita mech, and uh, this mech's armor is less than 50% times its armor max, then you can trigger a bugging out. You know, the locust is retreating uh, and issue an order to the locust to move to the retreat zone. Then you can have the, uh, you know, locust uh, retreat uh, trigger, which is also a map trigger, and says, you know, if the enemy is retreating and the triggering unit is a Curita, then you can um, have them retreat. But the Crescent Ox Revenge does this interesting thing where when a mech retreats, it's going to come back two missions later. So we actually add the triggering unit. So we're going to add the triggering unit to a list called Crescent Hawks Revenge Temporary, and we're going to add that unit on there. And then what happens is this repeats. So um, if we come back over here, on your next mission, you're fighting a panther and um, you're fighting a panther and an os scout. And by the way, look, we're um, automatically assigning um, the units. And so auto means take the player's mechs and automatically put them 
uh, into the battle setup as they're ones they're going to use, but they can move them and, and remove them if they want. Fixed means those units are locked in. So this means that from the player crew, grab the first and the second person, meaning Jason Youngblood and Rex Pierce, and fix them into positions one and two of the battle setup, meaning you cannot remove those units. You cannot remove those pilots. Um, auto means take the player mechs, the first and the second one, item zero and item one, and automatically assign them. But if you want, you can reassign them. Um, but you just uh, only have access to those two units. Um, you don't have access to any more. And if you're wondering why, you know, this is how it was in the Crescent Hawks Revenge, even though you had a lance of four units in the first missions, you can only use the first two. Uh, anyway, you fight a panther and an Oscow. They have orders to try and get across the bridge. When they're damaged, if their armor gets really low, they'll try and retreat. And if they actually successfully retreat, then they get added to the Crescent Hawks Revenge temporary list as well. Okay, now what happens on mission four? Well, now on mission four, what you have, uh, or mission three, I guess it is. On mission three, um, oh, and by the way, at the end of mission two, um, you know, you have all these victory screens. Kurt is talking to you. You end up adding the Jenner um, to your player mechs list. Because, okay, I don't know where it is right now, but you can find it in there. You add the Jenner to your, your mechs because in the story that happens, uh, Kurt fixes up Grease's Jenner and then joins you in combat. So because the Jenner is at the very end of the list, on the next mission, when you're setting things up, auto again, use player mechs 0 and 1, meaning the first two mechs, and use the very last one that you added. So in this case, it's mech 4. And that will show, uh, you know, like your Griffin, your Phoenix Hawk, and a Jenner. Even though you had like a Hermes and an Enforcer in between, it's skipping those units. So this is sort of selecting specific items out of this list. Um, and you are specifically selecting the first three crew units and you're locking them in place. That's what the fixed is. Now look at this. The Curita Invasion Force, it is pulling from the Crescent Hawks temporary list. The Crescent Hawks temporary list, when it was initially set up, contained a Whitworth, and it has been gaining every unit that has retreated since. So if the Locust retreats on level one, then that list is now Whitworth plus Locust. If the Panther and the Oscout both make it up, now it's Whitworth, Locust, Panther, Oscout. And so when you come to spawn on this map, um, you can be facing up to four units if you've let a bunch of units uh, escape. So that's sort of a fun, complex thing you can do with the triggers and sort of curse the people at Westwood for actually setting the game up this way because I actually had to modify quite a bit of the game menu because I never thought of doing this. But when I was trying to make the Crest Knox Revenge missions, it's like, oh, yeah, like that's I, I want to capture all that cool behavior. But, you know, you guys could use that. You could make missions where like units escape and if they escape, they come back later or they leave the battlefield temporarily and then they respawn or, you know, whatever. So you can get pretty fancy with that. Um, okay, and I'll leave the rest of the Crescent Hawks Revenge stuff for you guys to explore. It's mostly just prompts and um, trigger calls. The one thing I will mention is the game is designed so that between any battle is an RPG segment. So if you are in an RPG segment of the game and you try and travel to another planet, it starts a new RPG and it basically, you know, all your game variables and everything persist and it just loads a new map with new JSON data. You can load one RPG from another, from another, from another. You can sort of, you know, in an RPG, launch a new RPG. The way the battle system works, though, just due to some of the complexity that got built up over time and now is hard to undo, a battle always has to be launched from an RPG. So if you are in an RPG mode, if you are here and you want to launch a new battle, it's easy. But how do you do, for instance, long-term campaigns and stuff? Like how do you launch one battle and then another battle right away? What happens is you have to load in an RPG in between, and usually you load in an RPG that has a map that's just besides a player spawn blank, and you immediately bring up a prompt. Um, so if you do look at the Crescent Hawks Revenge stuff, um, whenever a battle is won you get all these victory messages and stuff and then it loads a new rpg and that new rpg basically immediately loads another battle um so it's just sort of an intermediate step and the rpg map i think tends to be like uh like none or something 
Yeah, so it loads maps empty because it's not an RPG map where you're actually going to walk around. It's just literally a quirk of the game that you actually do need an empty map between battles. So yeah, here's the empty map. No tiles, nothing, just a player spawn. Um, so if you are going to create maps where it's like one battle after the other, at the end of one battle, if you want to call another battle, you actually have to call an intermediate uh, sort of dummy RPG segment that then immediately loads the next battle. Um, otherwise, the game will just behave erratically and may not actually even load the next battle. So it's an unfortunate quirk of where we are. I might get it sorted out one day, but it is how it is for right now. Just wanted to remember to tell you guys about that um, so you didn't get confused later. Um, okay, so Creston Hawks, oh, graphics, units, and end. Um, all I'll say about graphics, because I have covered this before, but if you do want to add custom graphics into the game, you just uh, come into the images folder um, and like, you know, unit models. Um, these are all the unit models in the game. You know, and by the way, these were created by a guy named Luscious Dan. Made them for the MechWarrior Online forum. Did an amazing job of them. And then he basically just sort of said, anyone who can use these for games, for whatever you want, go ahead, take them. And he disappeared. And uh, I found him on Twitter once and I sent him a DM. He never responded. I basically just wanted to say, your, your things look awesome. I know you said anyone can use them, just want to confirm. And so he never said anything. So I'm just assuming he's okay with all this. But he did say everyone could use it. Um... But I just wanted to sort of directly shout him out and give him some credit here because these things look so badass and so cool. And when I first found this and added them into the game, I got so excited because they look so neat. Um, and yeah, so Luscious Dan, if you ever hear this, my friend, you are the best. And uh, thank you so much. But anyway, um, so all the graphics in the game, like the game sprites and stuff, they're just these PNG files, but they need a corresponding JSON uh, file. So for instance, here's the game sprites. And these were originally from CHR, Crescent Ox Revenge. I've heavily modified them as, as I've gone. So uh, not a ton of them are still the original CHR, but a few still are pretty close. But nonetheless, um, a JSON file that corresponds to an image file is basically game sprites.png, game sprites.json. Has to have the exact same name. And all it does is it specifies collections of sprites and then their name. And then you specify uh, where the frame starts, how many frames they have, and it will just automatically go uh, horizontal across items. So for instance, uh, let's see here. So light 1, 1 is a sprite under the unit collection. It starts at X0, Y0. So it starts right up here. It is 32 by 32, so it's about this big. And then it has two frames. So here's frame one, and then it goes horizontal to the next one, here's frame two. It's alpha, meaning the color that it ignores is purple. Um, and so that's how the purple is transparent. You could make whatever color you want transparent. Purple ends up being a pretty good one. You know, here's sprites for the weapons, for the fire, for explosions, all sorts of stuff. I kind of truthfully use this sheet as like a working sheet. So sometimes when I'm building new mechs, you can see I like pull pieces apart over here and mash them together like a, a kit bash, you know, or do some like Lego building. Um, so here's, you know, when I was redesigning the Loki and stuff and designing some other mechs here, I made the Marauder 2 out of the Marauder, um, make it look heavier and beefier. Um, there's the Goliath. So, yeah, I mean, I've just left those scraps there because I feel like, eh, why bother hiding it and taking it away? And I might need to use it in future. So, um, you know, and if you want to add new uh, icons to the game, you know, like you want the Blazing Aces or something, they have an icon. But uh, these are also game sprites. Um, so we have units. We also have weapons. We have effects. And we have icons. So I think the Blazing Aces are in here even possibly. Clan, Clan, Jade Falcon, Blake, Hawks. No, I guess I didn't add them, but... Um, so if you want a faction to be able, so in the um, star map um, file, you have your different factions. Uh, this is something somebody encountered because they were trying to make custom factions. So for instance, Clan Wolf Test, right? Their logo is the Comstar logo, uh, just because it's a test class. But when, uh, when the game loads this up, it also assumes that in the game sprites under icons, 
there will be a clan wolf test icon because it needs that for battle. So let's see. It should there should be one here. Clan wolf. Oh, maybe not. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter that it's not here because you never fight against them. But if you made a faction that you fought against, their name needs to be in here. If it's not, then the game will crash because it won't be able to find an icon to show them, show for them when they're like, you know, only detectable by radar. But you could even have these icons, by the way, be animated if you want. You could have a number of frames. So um, the sheet is, unit sheets are very flexible. You can easily add new units. You can give them, you know, I'm using two frames of animation. You know, add 10. You know, go nuts if you want. Um, so you can add more animation frames if you want. You could add higher resolution, do whatever you want. Um, now where these, how you actually assign a unit to have this sprite comes in through the unit uh, data files. So under units, we could look at 3025. Uh, oh wait, sorry, under, um, how did I arrange this? I rearranged this recently under units. Under JSON, here's the unit JSON stuff. So if we want to grab the inner sphere max, um, you know, we could say for light mech uh, group one, item one. So one underscore one, it's this mech. That looks like a panther to me. If we look at the, the unit JSON data and we look at panther, we can see its unit sprite is set to light one underscore one. If we want our panther now to look like, so this is assault group one. And this is, maybe we want unit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this would be assault one underscore seven. We could change this to assault one underscore seven. That's the naming convention I've used. You could use whatever naming convention you want, but I find that's handy to keep track of what all these units are in the sprite sheet. And then now the Panther would look like this guy. It'd look crazy. So we'll change him back to uh, one underscore one. Um, since we're speaking about editing units, um, everything, by the way, any JSON files in this units JSON folder get loaded into the game. So if you want to create custom units, just create a new um, JSON file. It doesn't have to have these underscores. These are just here to ensure these get loaded first into the game. Because if you create your own JSON file that has Panthers, um, you want to overwrite the panther that I've got in the game. So you want you don't want the underscores in your file name. You want your file name to not have underscores so the files get loaded after mine. So the underscores help ensure these files get loaded first. And you just create a new JSON file with new units, throw it in here, they'll get added into the game. Um, they exist in the game data. In order to see them in shops and stuff, you actually will have to... Um, you will have to come into the, uh, you know, 3025 inner sphere max available list. And you can either put the name of your new unit in here. So like my new mech, and then that will start showing up. Um, definitely don't save that. Or you can throw a text file in here that just has my new mech in it. And my new mech one, my new mech two, my new mech three. And again, all text files in this folder will get read by the game and any names it sees, it will assume they are available units that exist in the JSON. Um, so yes, uh, so that's how you, um, so, so the JSON format here for the unit should be pretty self-explanatory. Units also need to have a model. This is telling it what game sprite to use from the unit models that Luscious Dan made. Um, not for us, I was gonna say for us, but he didn't really make it for us. He made it for everyone. Um, but if you go into unit models here, uh, so the unit model is Panther. So we can go into the unit models and under the models collection, we will find a Panther and it will have an X and a Y coordinate and so on. And so now I my game knows where the unit model for the Panther is. Tons and internal. Those are just, you know, tonnages and internal hit points. Then you have your different models. The way the game works is when it encounters a name in a text file here. Uh, so units. Uh, actually, here, let's go in here. Available general. Okay, so if it encounters Panther, there's the Panther. What the game will do is it will select the very first model 
and it will assume that is the default model that you use if you're not specifying anything else. If you actually want to specify the Panther 10K model or another variant, then it's very simple to do. Um, we can see it, in fact, in the 3050 list, or 3049, I guess, list. So if we go in here and look in this text file, what we will see is under Panther, um, where are we here? Where's that Panther? There he is. Um, Panther is listed by itself, meaning the default model will appear, but Panther slash PNT 10K means use this variant of the Panther. So if you do want to use variants, all you need to do is add a slash and the variant that you want. Just make sure you spell it right, because if there's spelling errors, you can crash your game. Because <laughs> it's not very error tolerant for this. It assumes you've spelled things correctly. Um, you know, uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's how that works. Um, what else about units? Um, so the different factions have different availability of units. So for instance, so for the 3050 clans, you know, they have a different set of baseline available units. And I was told today I'm missing the rifleman. So actually I need to add that. I'm going to do it off stream because I just feel like I'm going to mess it up if I do it on stream. Um, but if you look in the star map, so not 3025 because we don't have clans yet. But if we come in here and we go into data, like let's grab 3050. 3050, there we go. Um, if we find clan wolf. So their available units come from the 3050 clan folder. And again, it's not the specific text file. It's any text file in that folder will contribute to this list. So if you add your own clan units, you can just add a text file in that folder and it will add them to the available uh, uh, available roster of any clan or any force that's using that as their available units. And then you can also have prevalent units. So um, yeah, so the clans here... So like Clan Ghost Bear, their available units come from the general and their prevalent units come from the general. The Clan 2Cs or the Clan Garrison um, come from a second line folder. So it's like there's the first and the second line, the 2Cs and the non-2Cs. So anyway, um, yeah, you can play around with this and uh, you can see, for instance, you know, like uh, Comstar draws its available units from the 2750 available general uh, folder, how Steiner draws it from the Steiner folder, and so on. And there's different eras, 3050, 3025, and so on. Um, okay. Let's see. Anything else that we got to cover? So we did Jason's, units, factions, maps. Hopefully that's all pretty self-explanatory. Again, the Discord is a growing living beast. Um, if you If you can't figure something out, just ask in the Discord. I'm trying to, like, answer people's questions so that uh, if there's something I was vague on, they can get it. And then the thing you could help with the most besides making content for the game is contributing to its documentation. As you can see, there's a ton here. It's taking me like three hours just to tell you guys all this stuff. My voice is killing me. I got to stop soon and go and eat some dinner. I'm starving. But, oh, and I got to clean up my carpet because water leaked into my basement again. Yay. Um, so yeah, like it's taking me three hours just to uh, explain all this. There's even more under the hood that you will kind of figure out as you play around with it. And it would take me forever to write this all down. So I literally am just out of steam having built the game and I need a break. So I'm not going to be the one who starts the documentation. But if you could contribute to that, that'd be an amazing way uh, to help out. Um, and it's even if you don't know how to mod things, if you can translate some of this knowledge. That's awesome. Um, the last thing is I was just going to say, um, when it comes to making your own campaigns and stuff, um, you have two options. And I kind of started out talking about this when I was talking about the organization. You know, I said, like, literally, you can come and copy every single file here, copy, and then go into the campaigns and, like, make a new folder and make your campaigns. You could do that. But you can be far more economical than that because if you know, for instance, that you're just going to use the same game sprites and unit models and 90% of the same stuff I'm using already, then you don't need to have all that excess stuff there. Because again, um, you know, when, uh, when we're in the legacy campaign, 
when we're in a battle, when it's trying to load up the, the battle uh, units, it won't find any uh, game sprites here, so it will just revert to the, gen the generic ones. One interesting thing is that the pilot portraits here in the Crescent Hawks um, legacy campaign are different than the pilot portraits in the career. I've been trying to slowly get myself off of the crutch of just reusing all the Crescent Hawks revenge graphics, even though I love them and I never want to give them up, uh, just to sort of have this be a little more, less, uh, you know, copyright litigious. <laughs> Um, uh, one of, one of the, uh, the fans contributed Kalfka, I think it was, uh, added all these awesome new game, uh, portraits, which were generated with AI, which is so cool. He got me really addicted to playing around with mid journey for a bit there. Um, but these pilot portraits are used by default and there's a pilot portraits, Jason, that specifies all the different pilot portraits that exist. Um, in the Crescent Hawks campaign, we just overwrite that by having our own pilot portraits and pilot Jason, meaning that in the legacy campaign, you see these nice old 8-bit ones. Um, and so, yeah, if you have files in your campaign that um, replace ones from the generic uh, data pool, then your files will get used instead of the generic ones. So that's how you can sort of customize parts of uh, the game without having to fully copy all the resources. Um, and then one other thing I'll mention is there's a load screen. Um, so for loading different missions, remember how I said maps, I've closed tiled, but maps can have a generic property like the terrain is barren or beach or city, or I think it was loading is beach or barren or city. Um, well, that tells the game what uh, loading screen to use. And for all the Crescent Hawks ones, it uses this awesome picture of dropships sort of landing. But if you go and look at the can the, the regular uh, resources. So if you play this in career mode, you won't see that loading screen. Instead, um, where is it in here? Instead, what you will see are uh, screens like this. Um, so here are the loading screens that you will see. And these were actually AI generated as well, which is kind of cool. Some of them have like odd quirks that I've noticed, but whatever, it's free and we can use it. So it's good for now. If you do want to make your own loading screens, have at it. If you put 4x underscore in front of a loading screen and then the terrain type, then you can actually put four images together and the game will just randomly um, select out of those four images. And you can also have multiple. So here's barren one, two, three. So it's like when you're playing on a barren map, there's one of like 12 images that will get loaded. And uh, the reason the 4x feature was added is because this is how the AI gives you the images and I didn't feel like cropping them all. But it's a nice handy little feature if you want to put together uh, you know, little four sized montages. If you don't have the four X, then it will just treat it as one big file. And so that's how the Crescent Hawks legacy, it's just one image. So it's just barren. There's no four X on it. Um, is there an automatic way to merge data sets? There isn't really, um, again, the game does it at, at playtime where it sort of merges the campaign with the general resources. But, um, yeah, there's not like a merger tool, but uh, I mean, hopefully with the, the roadmap I've given you here today, someone could write something like that in Python if they want. It'd be pretty simple. Um, it's just sort of like overwriting certain resources and keeping others fresh and then throwing it all into a folder that you could use as a campaign. Um, so there's that. Oh, there was something else I wanted to mention. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Let me go back in here just to see. Images... Something in here. Hmm. Um. Bring this up one more time. Oh, customize only where needed. Yeah. Hmm. Well, nothing comes to mind. But again, if something does in the Discord, we'll uh, we'll address it there. But uh, let's see, is there anything else I had to note? I have notes otherwise here today. Yeah, I don't think so. So, you know, as we're wrapping up, I just want to say thank you to all you guys who have actually been liking and playing and enjoying the game. Um, truthfully, I... I'm so happy that there a little community has formed around Discord for this game. I think... 
there's so much potential here for even more complex things you could do, even more complex stories, more complex battles than I've been able to do. Um, and, you know, if if it turns out that people don't make too much for it, that's that's cool. That's cool. But if people decide to make a ton for it, I will fully support that, and I s try and support them in any way I can because I think, honestly, like, you guys are the ones who could take this from something that's really cool, something that's really amazing. So, you know, like when I was a kid, I fell in love with the Crescent Hawks by playing Crescent Hawks Inception, Crescent Hawks Revenge. I always dreamed of a sequel. I always dreamed of, man, I wish there was another planet to go to. You could go around and buy mechs and do this and do that, blah, blah, blah. It took me 20 years, but <laughs> I finally made that happen. Um, but truthfully, it's not even really ending here with me. You know, if... Um, if you are playing this game or you played the old Crescent Hawks games and you wish there was some feature, you wish there was something, you wish there was a Robotech total conversion or a Star Trek one or a great Death Legion campaign, you know, turn on some music, crack open some Dr. Peppers and dig into some JSON files. And I've tried to design this game in a way that you could have your dream Battletech game too. So um, you guys are great. Go nuts with it. Thank you, and uh, I'll see you on Discord. So thanks, everybody.